All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another stream. Um, I'm John. I uh, do a bunch of Rust streams. And, and I started doing these because I wanted to do some more intermediate Rust stuff that, that sort of could sort of be learning materials for people either learning Rust or have learned Rust and want to see something more advanced being developed. Um, I have a Patreon page where I go through um, where I sort of post ideas for upcoming podcasts, or sorry, upcoming streams, um, or where I link to a bunch of projects I maintain. If you want to hear about upcoming streams, you can follow me there, you can follow me on Twitter, and I'll post basically everywhere. Um, today, we're doing a somewhat more advanced stream than some of the past ones. In particular, we're writing um, a client library for Apache Zookeeper, and we're going to write one that is fully asynchronous. So we're going to be using, um, we're going to be using Tokyo. Um, in particular, we'll be using the new Tokyo with the runtime as opposed to the um, the sort of old Tokyo core stuff. So we'll be using the new Tokyo. Um, Tokyo still uses future 0 0.1, even though futures are now in the process of being merged into Rust the language. Um, but we'll be dealing with Tokyo because we're going to want things like timers and such. So it's just easier to do it this way. Um, now, Zookeeper is, as I discovered, actually really poorly documented in terms of how its protocol works. Um, so basically the only page, ooh, unless they posted something new, I don't think so. Um, but basically the page you have to go on is this one, which mostly talks about sort of the high levels of the protocol and about the, the guarantees that the protocol gives you. Um, but it doesn't really say like what the wire protocol is, which is what we want. Normally, when you implement a protocol like this, you'll also be using Wireshark. So Wireshark is a really neat tool for, um, actually, I should uh, start Zookeeper. Um, so normally, you'd use Wireshark, you'd like watch on some interface, and you'd look on the, the Zookeeper port, and then normally, Wireshark is smart enough, oh, Um, let's see if we can ZK Cly. Great. Um, so normally you'd use Wireshark and it will actually decode the protocol for you and that makes it a lot easier to debug. Unfortunately, Wireshark also does not support Zookeeper yet, um, which is uh, pretty unfortunate. Well, let's see, set slash foo bar. Can I not do that? Oh, do I have to create it first? That's annoying. Uh, create slash foo bar. Uh, oh, it's on low closed. Uh, stop that. Uh, well, in any case, Wireshark won't actually help us all that much because it doesn't support the Zookeeper protocol. And so we're sort of left on our own, which is a little sad. Luckily, um, someone asked about this on um, Stack Overflow. Like, what is the protocol? How do I understand this? And whoever this person is, Chris Naroth, uh, posted a really good answer that sort of, it doesn't actually give you the full protocol description, but it does point you to all the places where you might want to start. In particular, um, Zookeeper uses something called Jute, which is a, uh, a Java serialization and deserialization library. Um, and it defines basically all the kinds of packets you can send over the wire. And so this will be a good reference for us. Um, in addition, uh, there, there are sort of Java definitions of all the classes that we might be able to use. Uh, there's a file that has various constants that might come in handy. Um, there's also in the Zookeeper code, so notice that I'm in Apache Zookeeper, the source code now. And the server has this method called process packet which sort of tells us at a very high level um, what does a request look like and then we could dig from here into how it's actually parsed. In particular, uh, we can see things like it first deserializes a header before it starts to switch on the type of the packet. So this is going to be useful for later. Um, the other thing that is useful when implementing protocol is that we'll be using, so there's a Rust Zookeeper um, crate already, which is synchronous. Um, and that, of course, has the entire protocol implemented. So here, there's a source proto, which has a lot of these um, constants and the classes and sort of basic protocol and serialization stuff. Um, I think IO is the thing that has, 
uh, yeah, so like how do you connect to Zookeeper? And so we'll be using this a lot, sort of digging through the existing code to try to build ours up. Um, the other thing I found was that someone actually proposed a way to add Zookeeper support to um, Wireshark uh, and have written a full disassembler for the Zookeeper protocol. So that's uh, this one here. Um, it's by ATI. Oh, this is called ATI, that's why. I was going to say it's weird for ATI to provide this. Um, but this basically goes through how do you parse an entire Zookeeper packet um, and determine what it is for and how do you like set inf interesting metrics like Wireshark would normally give you. It hasn't been merged. Uh, it's also in Lua, I think, and not in C, so it can't directly be merged, but it might also help us. Um, so I think we're basically going to get to it. Uh, let's see just whether this has a... No, they haven't added a protocol. Okay. Um, if you have questions while we go like this will be fairly technical and we'll do a lot of sort of digging into protocol specifics if you have questions feel free to ask them on twitch and then i will try to answer whenever i can i'll like try to glance over every now and again um and yeah this is going to be like pretty low level stuff but hopefully it'll be interesting um so we will start with here cargo new lib and we're going to call it tokyo zookeeper because that's what it is. Um, at sort of a high level, whenever you start a new crate, usually the the thing that's good to start out with is, wow, that's not even at all how that's built, um, is to start with some core struct that's gonna be the way that people interact with our library. In this case, it's gonna be a zookeeper thing, right? And the zookeeper thing you can use to issue additional commands and to wait for responses and those kind of things. So we're, gonna, we're definitely gonna have the struct. It's not entirely clear what's gonna be in there yet. Um, there'll probably be something like a TCP connection. We'll find out that later. Um, and then on zookeeper, we're gonna have a bunch of methods. In particular, we're gonna have a connect method. That's gonna give us a, um, that's a good question, probably an IO result. Actually, it's going to be a failure error. We're going to use the failure crate, which is great. Um, result self and a failure error. So this lets us, uh, failure is a pretty neat crate that lets you do um, uh, context wrapping for errors. So you can propagate errors up, including um, what caused an error. So you can have uh, complex errors or chained errors uh, with explanations and those kind of things. So we'll have a connect method um, and just because we're building a protocol, the first thing we'll want to be able to do is to connect to Zookeeper. I have no idea how hard this is going to be. I'm, I haven't, uh, I haven't interacted with Zookeeper before at, a, at an implementation level. But I think what we want is we're going to have something like, um, we're going to do something like, oh, actually, this is going to be a connect future. So because we're in future land, remember that nothing is synchronous. And so in general, if you want to connect to something, that is also itself going to be asynchronous. So in fact, this might just return a connect future entirely. Um, and so how we're going to test this, sort of the very first test we'll want to pass is we'll make a zookeeper um, and then so we're going to need here uh, futures 0 0.1 and Tokyo 0 0.1. We're going to need stern crate uh, futures, crate Tokyo, and then we're going to use Tokyo prelude. So the Tokyo prelude um, includes lots of different traits that are useful, things like stream, sync, future. Um, it again is most of the things you'll want that are not implementation details, but are for how to use Tokyo. And so our test is basically just going to be connect and then disconnect. That's all we need to do. We want to be able to do that without there being an error. Um, and so in this case, we will just do Tokyo. Uh, here we'll use super, so we'll use everything from above. We're just going to use Tokyo run. Now. Tokyo Run is a little bit weird in that it um, Tokyo Run doesn't really do much. Um, Tokyo Run just sorry, it's very warm. Uh, Tokyo Run just spins up a runtime, 
Uh, so this is a Tokyo runtime. This is sort of a thread pool that executes futures. It spins a bunch of timers, those kind of things. Um, and then it runs the future that it's given to completion, and then it returns. And then it terminates the, the runtime. And that's basically what we want here. Like we, we could be sort of more efficient by having it use the current thread and whatnot, but let's just do this in the most straightforward way. There's gonna be enough complexity anyway. So all we want to do is we want to be able to resolve the connect future. Um, and so the question of course then is what is this connect future going to look like? Well, we're gonna have to take some kind of address, which is for now gonna be just a string. Got her just in time, indeed. We have only just started. Um, so this connect future is actually gonna be pretty straightforward. Ooh, actually here we could do, uh, depending a little bit on how fancy we want to be. So, so we could here also use impl future uh, and say that we return something where the item is self and where the error is failure error. Uh, failure, I don't actually remember what the current version of uh, failure is. It is 0 0.1 as well, great. Failure. Um, yeah, so we could just use impl future here instead. Let's do that just for now. It might not actually work in the end because we might want to do uh, more things in the in the connect future. But just for now, let's stick with this and see how that where that takes us. Um, so for connect, the first thing we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to connect to Zookeeper. So we'll use um, where's my docs Tokyo. So for Tokyo, we want net TCP, uh, TCP stream, uh, TCP stream, and we're going to connect to, oh, does it actually have to be a socket adder? That's a little sad. Fine. Net socket adder. Uh, like so. Uh, and once we have connected, I guess actually, so this uh, this returns a result. And what we want here is we want to add context. For basically all of these, we want to add a failure context. I'm gonna skip over some of the context adding for now just because we want to get to the protocol stuff. Um, but here you could do something like this, right? And say, fail to connect to Zookeeper. Um, I don't think that will actually currently work, so we will just ignore it. Um, so instead, what we're gonna say is after we've connected, uh, that gives us a stream, and that stream, we're going to uh, do a self uh, handshake on stream. Um, this means that there's going to be a handshake method, which takes the stream that we have. So this is a Tokyo net TCP stream, and it's going to return a uh, impl future where the item is self and the error is failure error. Um, so the idea here is that we connect and then we have to do some other business like we have basically have to tell Zookeeper that we connected um, And this is because Zookeeper might like require a password or might require some configuration changes um, But in general you usually have to do some kind of handshake when you negotiate with a new server And that's what we're gonna do here. This is also of course asynchronous um, Now this is where it starts getting interesting. So the connect message uh, Let's see. So if we look at Rust Zookeeper, we look at source uh, IO so when you make an IO, it creates a bunch of stuff and then it sends a connect request. And a connect request is just a connect request. And notice this two len prefixed buff. So we're gonna see this a bunch. Um, if we look at the uh, Lua file as well, the, the Wireshark uh, uh, dissector, um, it basically first looks at the first four bytes as a number and consider that the length of the payload. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but then after that, it then reads an XID from the next four bytes, 
and then it adds an op code, which is the next four bytes. So basically, uh, I think this is in the Stack Overflow, if you get something like this, that's gonna be a header that sort of tells you how long is the following data, which connection is this, and then which operation are you, um, are you executing. In our case, if you look at connect request from, uh, did I have this open here somewhere? I think I used to, but. Um, source proto. So a connection request contains all these fields, and my guess is if we look at the jute file as well, yeah, connection request here just contains these things and is prefixed by this request header. So that's the other two fields that we saw. Um, and so what, what we're really going to want here, um, and this is a trick you often end up doing in protocols, is we're going to want some kind of a, a wrapper around a stream where we can write things and have them be automatically packaged and we can read things and have them be automatically packaged um, into the appropriate serialization protocol. Um, so we'll probably add a mod proto, and then this is going to do something like uh, request is uh, proto connection, maybe, and it'll have some fields, um, and then it will do something like uh, it's going to wrap the entire stream that we have in one of these packetizers in a sense so so that we can write request things and it will serialize them correctly including the headers and then we'll be able to read back and we read back um, deserialized results that where the, the headers have been unwrapped um, and so we'll do something like stream is going to be proto wrap stream and then we're going to do, say, uh, like stream dot send uh, the request. This is still just sort of pseudocode. Like, remember, we haven't written like proto connection, proto wrap, or send at all. We're just sort of setting up the, the infrastructure that we're going to use to communicate with the server. Because um, we want abstraction here instead of like writing the serialization code over and over and over again manually. Um, and so we're going to send a request uh, and then that's going to, yeah, that's a good question. What's the stream going to give us back when we send something? Um, it'll probably give us the stream back actually. Yeah, we'll have to figure out exactly how that's going to work. Uh, but then we're going to do a stream.receive um, and then that's going to give us back a uh, response and a stream and hopefully from that we'll be able to construct a zookeeper right so the idea is we send a connection request to the server eventually we get a response back and with that response that we get back we can finally construct the zookeeper client state um, and that will, of course, include the stream that we're dealing with, but also p potentially with um, this, uh, we might also need the state that the server gives us back with the handshake. And so at this point, this is indeed a future that will return self and can error with a failure error. Um, okay, so the question is, what's gonna be in proto? Um, so at some sort of high level, the thing that's really gonna be here is there's gonna be a struct that's gonna be a packetizer, if you will. Um, I don't know what's going to be in it yet. And there's going to be a function wrap, which takes a um, Tokyo net TCP stream, which lets you both read and write, uh, and returns you a packetizer. Packetizer. And uh, oh, I guess technically, if we want it to be really good here, this would be over S. This would take an S. Uh, where S is Tokyo prelude star, uh, where S is both async read and async write, right? So the idea is that um, we can wrap anything where we can send requests and read them back. The reason we don't want to hard code this to, to TCP stream is mostly for testing, but you could also imagine that you wanted to run this over some kind of other kind of reliable protocol. I don't know if um, Zookeeper supports like Unix sockets, for example. 
but there's nothing inherently stopping us from supporting that, and so we should make this generic over only the trait bounds that we need. Um, so this will probably be fairly simple. It will prob probably just be something like this. Um, and then, so that means this will hold a stream. That's an S. Uh, but the more important thing is we're probably going to implement sync for Packetizer. So sync is a, is sort of a future concept of something you can stuff things into. Um, so think of it as the sending end of a channel with implement sync. So it's a sync where you can put values and they go somewhere. Um, uh, where s is async write. Uh, so remember that for sending things to Zookeeper, we don't actually need to read from the channel, at least in theory. I don't know, the protocol could be different. We're about to find out. Um, right, so let's look at what the requirements for sync is. Where's the prelude? Um, sync. So in order to implement sync, we need the following methods. So we will implement them. Uh, so a sync item is the kind of things you can send on a sync, and that's going to be zookeeper request. And sync error is going to be just failure error, because everything is going to be failure errors, probably. Um, actually, that's a good question. It, it might not be that we want this to be the case. Um, it might be that we want to support protocol level errors as well, but that will probably be on the receive side. Like you send a request, and the thing you get back is a... Uh, say that you tried to I don't know, remove a key that wasn't there. We probably want to return a special kind of error that you can match on, whereas failure error sort of masks the underlying error. Um, when you send though, uh, when you send the request, the type of error that you got is probably not important. What matters is uh, in the response you got back, there might be some server defined error type that we want to expose. Um, so the sync trait has two main methods, a start send and pull complete. So start send, if you, the documentation has a bit more on them, but, but essentially the idea is that start send just wraps the thing you get it so that it's ready to be sent, but it, doesn't, it never does any blocking work. Pull complete is the thing that will actually drive the sending forward. And uh, the rule is that you, for any given item you want to send, you should call start send um, until it gives you ready. And then you call poll complete until that gives you ready. And that's the point at which you know it's been sent. Uh, just waiting for start send is not sufficient. Uh, so in our case, for example, start send will probably do the serialization. Uh, but poll complete is going to be the thing that does um, actually sends on the wire. Um, and the reason for this is uh, serializing is something we're going to have to do regardless. And we sort of only do, want to do it once. Whereas pull complete has to try sending on the TCP stream or whatever stream we have, and that might just like block. It might be the channel is full, um, in which case, in which case pull complete would have to block. Whereas start send we don't really want to have to block. Um, so we're gonna have this enum zookeeper request, right? Uh, re uh, and the only thing we know for sure is that that's going to have a connection request. It's going to have one of these guys. Um, and I trust the uh, author of the original Sukeeper crate to have written this correctly. So there's going to be one of those. Now, um, here's the question. How, so, so one of the things that often bites you in, in async land is that you need to be able to have something only half complete. Like imagine that you're, um, uh, yeah, I mean, in this case, we're sending a request and you could imagine that the, the TCP socket that we're using only has room for like, I don't know, half as many bytes as what you're trying to send. At that point, the next time poll complete is called, you need to send only the remaining bytes. You don't get to send the first bytes again. Um, there are many ways to deal with this. The way we're going to deal with this is that we're going to have an outgoing buffer and an incoming buffer. Um, and so when we serialize, we're just going to serialize and append all those bytes in one go. And then pull complete is just going to try to flush that buffer. Um, this will make sense pretty soon. So there's going to be an outbox 
there's going to be a vec Q8, um, and there's going to be an inbox, which is going to be a vec Q8. Uh, so the outbox is um, bytes we have not yet sent, and the inbox is going to be uh, bytes we have not yet deserialized. So in start send, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, do something like, huh, that's a good question. We're basically, we're going to push a bunch of bytes. So we're, we're going to serialize the request. Uh, let's do this the, the slow way first. So we're going to take the item and let's say that we're going to require that Zookeeper requests can be, um, can be serialized in some meaningful way. So in this case, we will do uh, item dot serialize, right? This is not going to be the final API because this might be fairly inefficient, but let's go with this for now. Um, and then we're going to have to do something like, oh, actually, ooh, that's a good question. So remember how um, in the protocol, the protocol uh, here. So we have to send this request header as well. And the request header has a connection ID and a type. Um, the type is basically the, the request that you sent. What type of request is it? So that the receiver knows what to deserialize it as. Um, in our case, we sort of want to add that automatically. So my guess is the serialize method that we add on Zookeeper request is also going to produce both the um, uh, both the type and the bytes following it. Whereas the connection ID is only really known by the packetizer, by the stream, it's tied to the stream. Um, and the length as well, we don't really want serialized to have to deal with. We sort of want to be able to serialize all the data and then count the length and add it at the end. Um, so this is going to be uh, payload going to be type and payload, right? And then XID is going to be some way to get the current XID. Um, the length is going to be the length of type and payload plus however long the XID is. In this case, we know it's four bytes. Um, and then we're going to do self.outbox.extend, uh, or I guess dot push. Okay, I'm going to write this in pseudocode first and then we can discuss after. Um, so the idea is something roughly like this, right? Where we first serialize the, the request itself, then we get the stuff that has to go at the beginning, and then we push all of that to the outbox, and then we return OK. Um, so notice in this case that first of all, there's basically no way in which this can fail. Um, it, it basically just pushes into a buffer and does nothing more. And then pull complete, it actually turns out to be really straightforward too. Um, all it's really going to have to, have to do is um, push stuff from the outbox that we have not yet pushed into the TCP stream. So we're going to have to keep track of a prefix of outbox that has been sent. Uh, which is going to be out i, or I guess out start prefix of inbox. Um, so the reason this is useful um, is that imagine that we have a buffer of 100 bytes, and we want to send that to the underlying TCP stream. It comes back to us and says that it sent the first 50 bytes. Now, what we could do, of course, is just remove the first 50 bytes from the buffer and just keep the last 50. But this is really inefficient because now the uh, now we have to copy all the last 50 bytes to the beginning of the of the list of the vector. Um, instead, what we sort of want to do is just keep track of the fact that the first 50 have been sent and that the last 50 still need to be sent. And then it's only whenever we've actually sent everything that's in the buffer, then we can clear everything. So this saves us a bunch of copies. Um, it makes the code a little bit uh, less nice, but I think it'll be fine. In this case, uh, most of what we're doing is that we're going to do um, 
self stream uh, write, and we're gonna write self dot outbox self dot out start dot dot right so, and then we're gonna use the try actually it's a good question uh, yeah I think there's a try ready it should work with this so n is gonna be so what try ready does is it's a, it's a macro often used in futures land the try ready macro will try to call this method. So it expects that the method it's calling is something that returns something like this. Uh, so a result async with an error. Um, and if the if it gets async not ready, or if it gets an error, then it returns. Otherwise, it gives you the value. So you can think of this as sort of as like try or the question mark operator just for, for futures. Um, and so n here is going to be the number of bytes that we wrote. Um, and so in our case, what we want to do is self uh, out start plus equals n. And then if, um, if we've now written everything that was in the outbox, then we can clear the outbox and, and start from the beginning. So this means that the outbox actually could keep growing unboundedly if we get really unlucky with our TCP sends, but it doesn't mean that we have to do way fewer men copies. So I think on the whole, this is fine. Um, at the end, if, if it successfully wrote out everything that's in the stream, then we can return okay, uh, async ready. Right, so this is saying that, um, actually, uh, only if this is the case. Otherwise, we still have more stuff that needs to be written. So the idea here is that we try to write as many, as many bytes as we can. Um, we get told how many bytes were written. This be plus n. Yeah, thanks. I uh, caught it without seeing. It didn't cheat. <laughs> uh, good uh, that you're uh, watching me, though. Um, yeah, so the idea is that if the stuff that's been written out is everything that we needed to write, then we're done. We can say that we've successfully pulled for completion. Um, otherwise, there's still more bytes that have to be written, and so that's what we return. Um, of course, this code in start set and does not currently work, and, and probably won't work for a little while, um, in particular because we're going to need this uh, zookeeper request, uh, the serialize method. Uh, and so one question is, what is serialize going to even do? I think if we want to make this decently efficient, so remember, Currently, what this is going to do is um, let's say that serialize returned a vector, right? So let's imagine for a second that it's something like this. Um, so imagine it was like this. Then now we're going to allocate a vector. And we're going to return it here for type and payload. And then when we append it to the outbox, we're basically going to extend the outbox and then copy all the bytes. Now, that's not a problem for a connect request, for example, that is pretty small. But in Zookeeper, you can set and read relatively large values if you wanted to. And so we don't really want to copy all those bytes. So what we're going to do instead is serialize into. Uh, we're going to take a, let's just do this the ugly way for now. Um, So what this is going to do is, is instead of returning a new vector, it's going to just extend the underlying vector. Now we have to be a little bit careful here because remember there also has to be room for XID and length and those have to come before the type and payload. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to do a little trick where we push a dummy value for XID and length. Actually XID we can probably get regardless, but for the length we'll just push zeros and then we'll change them after we know how long it is. So that way we never have to do this extra um, allocation and memory copy. So serialize into is unimplemented for now. Uh, the idea is that it's going to uh, serialize all the bytes in the current request. So it's probably just going to match on self. It's going to write out the fields in the appropriate order with the appropriate type um, into the buffer. And it's going to return how many bytes it wrote. It's going to be fairly straightforward. Um, 
could even be that we just want to implement serialize here. But let's, we'll do it simple. Um, so this means that now we're going to have some way to get the XID of a packetizer. Uh, my guess is that this has to just be stored in here. What is an XID? It's an int. What is an int in uh, Java? So let's see, connect request is an int for protocol version. And the zookeeper Rust implementer chose that as an i32. So int is an i32, so XID is going to be an i32. Uh, like so. I wonder whether you can have multiple connections open. This connection ID makes me think that you can multiplex connections onto a single stream, which we might want to support later. But for now, let's just ignore that. Um, we'll probably want a way to set the XID of a packetizer. Uh, we'll probably also want a uh, like a new for packetizer because we don't actually like the outbox, outstart, inbox, and instart. We don't want caller to have to deal with. Um, so this is going to be a pug crate, so you can only call it from within the same crate because we don't want users to create packetizers. In fact, packetizer is not even going to be public. Um, it will have to be available within the crate though because we're going to use it from source lib, for example. Um, so new is going to take a stream. It's going to give you a packetizer s. In theory, this could give you like an uninitialized packetizer. Um, so we could have a separate type for when it has not yet been connected. Um, but I don't think there's a good reason for us to do that, at least not for the time being. So a new packetizer is going to have that stream. It's going to have outbox be empty. Uh, it's going to have out start be zero. And same for inbox and xid is initially going to be zero uh pub crate fn thanks so that gives you a packetizer uh in fact let's just have that be instead of this wrap function uh zookeeper request is also going to be public for the crate serialize into is not uh so what we're going to do here is we're going to need a way to serialize and deserialize numbers into byte strings because we have, say, an i32 and we need to write the appropriate bytes onto the wire. Um, for this, one of the nice things to use is the byte order crate. Um, so this does all sorts of endianness and whatnot. So we go to here and say byte order is what version? 1.2. We need extern create the byte order. Um, and I think this gives us a write bytes x, which is really convenient for these kind of things. Ah, yes. um, so write bytes x basically gives us a, uh, I guess we'll need stand. No, that's fine. Uh, it basically gives us the ability to take anything that implements write, um, the write trait, and call like write i32, write, so we can write a value and have it be directly written, and vec u8s implement write um, directly, and that just causes the vector to be extended, which is basically exactly what we want. Um, so in our case, what this means is that here we can do. Uh, self dot outbox dot write uh, i32 and that's going to be the length so actually let's check what that length is what type is that length um, well, it doesn't really help where's the request header well, it's just xid my guess is an i32 but i figured i'd uh no, that's just what it writes out. Big Endian. Great. So yeah, you see the the other zookeeper crate for Rust also uses byte order because it's really convenient for this. And this is why this file is going to be a really nice reference for us. And this saves us a lot of work where, that we would have to reverse engineer from the Java implementation otherwise. Um, 
Notice that we have to tell it what endianness it is. So remember uh, from your computer science background or or not, uh, uh, when you have a when you have a number that's multiple bytes, whether you print out the highest value byte or the lowest value byte first differs between different computer architectures um, and between different network protocols. And so in this case, what we're saying here is that the uh, network protocol for um, for Zookeeper's big endian. Um, so the, the, the big bytes come first. Um, and so we have to tell, when we write out this I32 onto the wire, we want to write it in that order. Um, and so we're gonna use here, uh, this and big endian. So we're gonna write ID, I32, big endian. Um, and remember that we don't know the length yet. So here we'll just write zero. And because this is a vector, we know that it will not error. Uh, should never fail because this will just allocate a larger vector if need be. Um, how did I? Right, uh, and then we will write out the uh, the xid, which is going to be the same self dot xid, um, and then we will do uh, item dot serialize into, and we're going to give it a we're going to give it the outbox. And this also should not ever fail. Um, so this is going to give us the n, which is how many bytes it wrote. And here, we now have to be a little bit tricky, um, because here, remember how we wrote out a length of 0 above there? We're going to have to overwrite that 0 with the true value. Um, this is a little bit more finicky. Um, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to keep track of where, like we can basically go n plus four backwards in outbox. Um, so this is going to be at mute uh, self outbox. Um, length i is going to be self outbox len. And so from length i, to length i plus four, right? So that range is where the length is stored in the outbox. And then we just want to write, we want to do this right again. Uh, so in fact, here we could, if we wanted to just like push four empty bytes, um, right, maybe that's what we should do. Just push zero. Dummy length xid uh, type and payload um, set true length. Um, and then the question is I think we can now just do length. Not right. I think uh, mutable, ref mutable slices also implement right, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Nope. Implement right for. Yep, it looks like it. How is that implemented? Right. So this will return. Um. It would return an error if you tried to, if you tried to write. Well, if you try to write more than how long the slice is, it would only write as long as the slice was, and then tell you it only wrote that many bytes. Uh, in this case, we know that the slice is of length four, so that this should all be all fine. Um, and so now we've basically eliminated that one copy that we would have had otherwise. Um, and so that's pretty nice. We still, of course, are missing what serialize into is going to do. Um, I think we might as well just write this straight away because we know we're going to need it. Uh, another question here is whether we'll even need um, whether serialize into should take self by um, like own self. It it could very well be because you can imagine some of these holding lots of bytes. Um, actually, here's what we're gonna do. I think. Well, unclear. Let's just leave it like this for now. Um, so this is going to, now we don't, we only have one 
uh, request type, and that is connect request. Actually, this does not need to be called connect. This does not need to be called request. This does not need to be called zookeeper. Keep it easy. So we're going to have a request connect. Um, and if we get a request connect uh, of, oh, it's a little annoying we have to repeat these. See, this is one of the things that's a little bit annoying about um, Rust enums is when you have an enum that contains a struct, um, you can't in the code below assume that it is that variant and start using like dot fields. If you hit the expect with should never failed, Will it be easy to see something like eno mem? So uh, if you run out of memory, there's actually no, you don't get an error from vectors if you run out of memory. This is one of the things that people have been a little bit sad about with Rust is that it's not easy to detect whether you run out of memory. Uh, like uh, if you have a vector, if you call dot push, it just will, it, it doesn't have anything in the type to indicate that push can fail. Or rather, you don't have a way of checking. If push failed because you're out of memory, then your the thread will just panic. And so this is why here as well, we know that the, the write to the vector will never fail. Like it will never return an error. It could panic if you run out of memory. Um, but so if you get enomem, what you'll see is a thread panic. Um, Okay, so we actually need to deconstruct this here, which is a little bit sad, but I think we'll have to live with it. Um, uh, this has to be a ref. And so the question of course then is how do we uh, serialize a request connect? Well, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. We have to uh, write an i32, which is going to be the, the request type. So this is when we need all these defs. Um, pub uh, enum opcode. Uh, and this is going to be, actually, this is not going to be pub. And this is going to be wrapper i32. It's going to be notification is zero. Uh, create this one. Actually, let's do this. Uh, D3. Actually, let's do QA D3W. I love the macros. What's the vim shortcut for uppercasing a character? I can't actually remember. That's too bad. Oh no. Uh, Why is it complaining at me? Uh, dev minor Tokyo Zookeeper cargo check. So the idea is that this um, this opcode, because we define it as having the representation i32, in theory, it should just interact nicely with uh, with what we get from the wire. But it's complaining because. Uh, this is now just request. Oh, I didn't finish writing this. Uh, opcode. Uh, oh, is there not an opcode for connect? That seems weird. Um, where's our connect request? Write. Oh. I see, so connect does not send an opcode. It probably then also does not send an XID.
Okay, so we do have to handle connection requests separately. I guess we'll deal with that later then. Um, 120. Try ready is not in scope. Macros. Um, well, these are various unrelated errors. Uh, Alright, that's all fine. Wait, am I mistaken? Is try ready actually in Tokyo? No. Um, all right. Yeah, so we now have this opcode enum that contains all the all the different opcodes we need. Um, what this sort of suggests to me is that when you create a new packetizer, um, I think it's going to have to immediately place there the um, the connection request actually it's a little awkward i guess we can actually work around this by um if i if let requests connect this item i want if not let but apparently i don't get to do that Um, yeah, because we're also going to have to know that we shouldn't set the true length. <sighs> fine, fine. a little ugly, but it's how it's going to have to be. Um, the dummy length as well should only happen here. So the, observ the observation is that if you, when you initially connect, you don't send length and you don't send, um, and you don't send the XIDs. You basically don't send a request header because it's not a request, it's the, the first connection. Uh, so if you see here, um, this is in the Rust Zookeeper crate. So he has a connect request um, and he implements write to. The write to traits is the thing that. Um, where is right? Write to. Where are you at? Yeah, so the write to trait. Um, oh, he rewinds it. That's how he does it. Oh, that's not terribly important. Um, where is the. Oh, maybe it does have a request. It's a good question. Let's see. So where's the thing that does connect? Uh, and connect request. Oh no, there is an opcode. Okay, great. It's using auth. So this can all go away, and this is going to write off code off. Uh, does that return anything for us? No. So we're going to have to keep track of the length. Initially, we write zero. Uh, here, we've written four bytes. Um, I guess we can go back to this. So the raw request here, I think, is just the way that he uh, or she, I don't know who the author is. But if we look for here for raw request, no? Let's see here, source, uh, lib, no, zookeeper, raw request. OK, and how is this used? Oh, that's unhelpful. IO. Ah, in flight and buffer. Okay. 
Where is the thing that sends things? Ready channel, ready timer, sender. Self .tx send. Okay, so they send uh, raw requests on a channel. So they, it looks like they have some kind of thread that's running in the background that does the uh, buffer pushback connect request. Okay, so where is this buffer? So from source lib, what do they do when you create a new zookeeper? Zookeeper. ZK thread. Okay, that's presumably the thread that they spin up. So connect creates a ZK IO and it has a watch thread. And it's the watch that's the sender. So I think that's the thing that actually sends requests out onto the wire. And so, yeah, that looks like it. So what does it do when he gets a new raw request? Uh, nothing. That doesn't seem very likely. So where is this try write buff? Connect so it really just calls connect request, pushes the request onto the buffer. This takes the request off the buffer. This writes the requests data. Wait, that doesn't seem right. Where does it add the wrapping? I think it's this try write buff. That will be my guess. Aha. So it first writes. Okay, that's unhelpful. Huh, so where does he write the length though? So they create a channel, TX and RX. They buffer up the raw request, which is the connection. And now the question is, where does that disappear to? So in Source Zookeeper, when you create a new one, they create a ZKIO, they get an IO sender. I will run zookeeper. ZK thread IO dot run. So what is a sender on IO? Okay. So that just sends IO things. Request header. Okay, so when you make a request, you make a request header. To len prefix buff. Request header and request. Oh, I wonder whether the, the data is actually the whole thing. That's why, okay. So this business, yeah. So the this is where they um, they pull the same trick we do of uh, allocating a vector, moving forward, then writing out the buffer, and then moving back, and then writing the length. Um, but this to me suggests that. So if you, if you look at the code that we had here. Uh, where was it? Uh, here? No. Here? No. Um, 
Yeah, the, I think this connect request does not actually have an XID. I think the opcode here, the buff is just the length in the connect request. And then there's an opcode on the raw request, but that's not actually something that's sent, which is a little confusing, but all right. So I think what we're gonna do here is, um, I'm just gonna do, we're gonna treat connection separately. So a uh, connection, um, we do something and for the rest we do all this business. Specifically for the, for the connect, all we really need to do, oh actually we do have a length regardless. That's interesting. So here, we're just gonna serialize the item. Otherwise, we're gonna write out the XID and serialize the item. So this is really just saying uh, N zero, otherwise four. Let n is n plus this, like so. Uh, and this has to write out n. So what we're doing here is we're always going to have to add the length. Um, and then if it's a connection, if it's a connect, then we don't add anything more. Like specifically, we don't add a request header. Uh, otherwise, we do add the XID. So that adds four bytes. Um, and then we call serialize into, and our serialize into for connect is just not gonna write the opcode. Um, and so that's how we end up not having a request buffer at all, uh, a request header at all. It will just write the, the actual connection request. Whereas if we had say request create or something, um, that would indeed write out um, the opcode as well. And that would add another four bytes, making up the full request. All right, so the question then is, what do we have to write out for connect request? So here, we can actually reuse code. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, so in this case, notice how because this person is writing directly into a writer, they have to try everything. Whereas for us, we don't actually have to do that. We can... Uh, we know that this will always succeed. Um, so we can do this. Um, in this case, protocol version, last XID scene, timeout, session ID. The password is a little interesting because the um, the password, let's see. So that's a VEC U8. So the question is how are VEC U8 serialized? Again, we turn back to what this person is doing. So write to is the way that they write requests out. Um, and so the question, of course, becomes, how is write to implemented for vec t? It is, you write out the number of elements as an i32. And then you write each of the elements. For a u8, that's just writing the u8. Um, so in our case, we will just do, um, we'll write an i32, which is going to be the password dot length, uh, which is dot len, um, as i32. And then we will simply write all. Uh, so that's going to be using um, io write. So we're going to then also write out the entire password. And again, none of these should fail. Um, one way we could do this in a sort of neat way is we can use uh, this. It's a little ugly. I don't really want to have to do that. Um, actually, let's have this just return a result view size with a like an IO error. So the, the reason I want to do that is um, just because it makes this method easier to write because I don't have to unwrap everywhere. I can just have the question marks and then I can unwrap where we call serialize into. Um, so in this case, we write out these. It's all good. 
and then we return OK. And this is going to be then uh, 4 for the protocol version plus, actually, we don't even have to really return the use size because we have this thing called magic. Watch this. So we can actually figure out what the length is. Specifically, uh, we, that means we don't need this, don't need this, don't need this. Uh, don't even need any of this. Uh, and the n we have to write is uh, let written is self dot outbox dot len minus length i minus four. So that's how long is the outbox now? How long was it before we wrote the length? Uh, minus the four bytes for the length. So that's how much we wrote out, and that is indeed the length of the payload. That way we don't have to track this manually either, which is nice. Uh, these are all going to be buffer. Right, so that writes out the connect. And then, of course, we need to have some way to pull out responses from this. And the way we're going to do that is we are going to take uh, impl stream. So we're going to, we have sync for sending requests and we have stream for getting the responses back. Uh, for packetizer s, where s implements async read. Now, Tokyo stream, sort of the inverse of sync, um, has a very similar um, signature as well. So there's an item, and this is the stream item. So that's going to be a response. Error is still going to be a failure error. Although keep in mind, this is where we. Um, this is where we may want to provide more introspection. Like if the server returns us an error saying this node already exists or something, um, that's a that's a message we might want to propagate to the user because they might want to do something with that particular error that happened. All right, let's see. Uh, so stream as opposed to as opposed to sync does not have two separate methods. It just has uh, it just has poll. And poll should should um, return uh, async. It should return an error if there's an error. It returns async not ready if it does not yet have an item to uh, release. It returns ready none if the stream is completed and no more items will be yielded. And it returns OK async ready sum and then an item if an item is to be yielded. And so here we have sort of the, the a very similar problem to what we had for sync, namely that we might do a read and only get an incomplete item, right? In which case we have to yield none, but we have to remember the bytes that we read because if we do another read, we're not going to get them back yet um, if we read again. Um, and so we're going to pull a fairly similar trick. So this is why we have the, the inbox on packetizer. It's basically going to do the same thing. I think we don't even need this in start. Uh, let's leave it for now. So what poll is going to do is uh, it's first going to check whether it has a full item. So it's going to parse out the length. Uh, what's the first minutes of the stream? Would you mind explaining what Zookeeper does? Oh, that's a good point. point. I, I don't think I even did this. So Zookeeper is a, um, you can think of it sort of as a key value store. So its API is fairly straightforward. It's um, you can create keys and keys are paths. So they're slash separated and hierarchical. Um, and you can set any binary string as the value for any key, but it provides atomic guarantees such as um, if I set a value, I know that everyone else will see that value. It provides things like um, uh, compare and swap sort of. So you can write a value only if its value is this value and has not changed. So this is one way you can use it to maintain a configuration or a cache. It's sort of like a very highly consistent key value store. Um, now, 
in a sense, the API for Zookeeper has not really become important yet. So all we're trying to do now in the very beginning is be able to connect to Zookeeper at all and set up the internal infrastructure we're going to need in order to send and receive requests. Um, uh, but but down the line, of course, the API for Zookeeper will become important when we start designing the uh, uh, the API for the library. Um, I hope that roughly makes sense. So Zookeeper, you should just think of it as a a very powerful key value store. It's not very fast, but that is because it is so highly consistent and give gives these very strong operations you can't often do in other um, uh, in other stores. Um, you can also run it very fault tolerant. So you can run it on many machines, and if one machine goes down, the system still operates, and you're guaranteed to always have the same uh, guarantees. Sort of like Redis on steroids, although you should think of it as it doesn't try to provide data storage. It is usually used more for a configuration uh, where you have a large deployment of servers and they all need to agree on like who the primary server is, for example, or on the current configuration or on uh, where different files are located. You use Zookeeper for that kind of meta information to ensure that all the servers sees the same information and that even if there are faults, like some machine fails, um, you still have guarantees about um, uh, you still have guarantees about what servers uh, what servers see and what operations succeed and fail. Uh, yes, it is indeed Apache Zookeeper. That is accurate. Uh, okay, so our poll. Um, what it's basically going to do is it's going to first it, it sort of has to check whether it has enough data. We don't want to do a read if we don't need to, right? We don't want to do a system call read. So imagine that you do a system call read and you get back two full requests. So you're, you're filling up your buffer and it's now filled with two requests. Um, if the user does one read, they get the first and that's also what filled the buffer. If they then do a read again, you already have a request in your buffer. So you don't really want to do a new system call because that might block, although in this case it wouldn't, but you don't really want to do another system calls because they're fairly expensive. You want to use the one that's already in your buffer. Um, well, I'll write this code sort of the straightforward way first, and then we can iterate on it. Um, so we know that the length uh, here, we're going to need uh, read bytes x as well. Uh, we know that the length is going to be uh, start. dot dot read um, i32 big Indian uh, we can use question mark here just because we know it's not going to fail um, and it's shorter than doing the opposite um, yeah so what we're going to do is we're going to look at our oh actually uh, if So, um, sorry, the reason I'm pausing is because it might be that we don't even have enough bytes to read the length. So I think what we want to do is if self.inbox.len minus self. Uh, is it called just in start or inbox start? In start. In start. Uh, is less than four. So if we don't even have the. Uh, the length, then what we want to do is uh, try to read from the underlying socket. Um, so self stream uh, we want to do, what's the prelude? Async read. Oh, there's something like this for write as well, I think, but um, yeah. What's a buff mute? I have no idea what that is. 
Ooh, but it has nice secret places. Sorry, um, I got distracted. So um, what we want to do is we want to read from the underlying stream so that we get enough bytes to continue. So we're going to do dot read. Uh, can I do the same for the right? I think I just want to do right there. I think there's a um, recommendation to use poll right instead of right. No, that's when you implement. Oh, uh, we also sort of need to do flush here. Uh, turn. Almost forgot about that. Um, so here we now want to do self stream pull flush. Uh, so even if we've written out everything to the wire, pull complete shouldn't complete until the stream has also been flushed, which is what we're saying here. Um, for stream, what we want to do is we want to call the read method, uh, I guess pull read. Um, and here, uh, mute self inbox self in start dot dot. Um, now, some of you may already see what's wrong with this. I'll just write it out and then we can talk through it. Um, this code will not actually work, but I'll explain why in a second. Uh, but we're gonna try to read some bytes um, and then uh, while that is the case, uh, if n is zero, then to do, I'll talk about why that's special later. Um, actually, if yeah. later. Uh, so we're going to try to read out the length and then we are going to see whether len minus self dot in start uh, minus four. So that's how many bytes we have available to parse. If that is less than length, then we are going to also do this. I, I realize this code is currently pretty messy. We're going to rewrite it a bunch. This is just to get the flow ready. So the idea is that if you don't have enough bytes, then you read more bytes. Um, and so here, if we don't have enough bytes to read the length field, then we do reads until we can read the length field. Uh, then if we don't have enough bytes to deserialize the object, um, because now we have the length, then we do another read. Um, and then at this point, we know that we, uh, we must have enough bytes available. And so now um, we do, now we sort of deserialize, right? So we're gonna do something like response parse. Uh, we're gonna do, I guess, XID is gonna be uh, self inbox So here, self in start in start plus equals four because we've now read the length field, and then self in start uh, to self in start plus four dot. And actually, we can just use this um, dot read i thirty two. So this is reading out the um, the x id which we know is there. There's also the op code which we know is there. So at this point, plus equals four for the XID, plus equals four for the opcode. Actually, let's not read out the opcode. Um, and then we par when then we want to call parse. What we're going to do there is we're going to give parse self inbox from the start, so from right where the opcode starts to uh, length minus four to the end of that payload. Right? Does that roughly make sense? So the idea is we read until we know that we have enough to parse a request, and then we parse that request. So that's what this piece is doing. 
It's sort of extracting just the bytes that correspond to that request and asking and trying to parse a response from that. Um, now, of course, this code is currently pretty messy, and there are a bunch of extra cases we have to deal with. Um, for example, if you try to read and you get zero bytes, what that means is the other side is hung up and you're not going to get any more items from it. Um, there's also the case that poll read will not extend a vector. So in this case, our inbox is going to be pretty useless because um, poll read is just going to try to read into the bytes that we already have, which is not at all what we wanted to do. Uh, and so this code is currently pretty broken, but I hope you see roughly the approach that we're going to take. Um, the way we're going to rewrite this to be a little bit simpler is um, we are going to, hmm, that's a good question. Uh, let mute need, need is four. So while this is less than need, then we're going to have some magic here. Uh, magic uh, to extend inbox. Actually, let's just write the magic straight away. Um, so the idea that is that if we find that we need more bytes, that we're going to grow inbox by a little. And then we're going to um, call poll read. And if poll read succeeded, then we're all good. Then we try to parse. If poll read did not succeed, then we shrink inbox again by changing its length. Um, so here, uh, we're going to do self.inbox.spec. Uh, where's the set len? I don't actually want set len. I want uh, where is the method I want? Resize. That's the one I want. So. We know that the current length, so target length is going to be the current length plus, and then the question is, how many bytes do we want to read at a time? Um, now, one thing we could do is we could just say plus need. So need here is going to be sort of a, um, a counter of how many more bytes we need than what we currently have. Or rather, need is going to be how many bytes do we need in order to return okay it's basically like how much how much stuff do we need in order for to correctly parse an element um, so we could reserve just enough space for that um, i think instead what we're going to do is uh just to amortize this cost a little actually no let's do that this will be fine so our target length is that plus need. And so we're going to do self.inbox.resize. Now resize takes a new length. Um, and if it's shorter, it will truncate. If it's larger, it will grow the vector if necessary. Uh, and then some value to set the grown elements to. In our case, we want to resize to target len. And we're going to fill it with zeros. Um, then we are going to match on poll read from uh, read from is going to be inbox len right um, so the idea here the idea here is basically that we uh, we take all the all the bytes that we have so far, and we allocate a bunch of memory at the end to make room for the more bytes that we have to read, um, and then we try to read into that segment of memory. So resize creates that segment of memory, and then pull read tries to read into that segment of memory. Um, if we get OK, then we get an N. Uh, let's do OK zero. Is that's going to be special? Actually, no. Let's do that. Uh, or uh, let's match that with a question mark. 
Um, uh, async ready uh, or OK async not ready. Uh, so async not ready means that nothing was read. It, th that call would have blocked and so nothing was read. Um, it, let's check that that actually is a guarantee that holds. I'm pretty sure it will, but um, n equals zero implies that end of file. Okay. So not ready specifically means that, uh, ooh, what are they written for poll read? If no data is available for reading, uh, that's really vague. It doesn't explain whether you get a ready or a not ready on zero. I'm gonna assume that they've done something sane. Uh, so not ready means that the underlying socket has not been closed, it's just blocking. Um, and in that case, what we'll want to do is we'll self inbox resize back to read from. Right, because we basically set the length back to what it was. Uh, I guess we have to do zero. What can I do? Truncate? Is that a thing? I think truncate is a. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we basically we we don't undo the allocation that we did, if any. We just shorten the vector. Um, so that when we go through this loop again, we'll, we'll return. And in this case, we want to return async not ready. Because we tried to read the more bytes we needed and we did not get them. So in that case, what that means is we're not, uh, we're not able to yield another element yet. Um, if we pull to read and get ready, so some number of bytes were read, then now what we want to do is self.inbox.truncate uh, read from plus n. Um, so this is saying that now, uh, we got n more bytes, uh, and yeah, okay. Uh, so now the real length of the inbox is where we started to read plus the n bytes that we read, and then we'll just let the while loop go again, which will show us whether or not we get to continue. Um, of course, here it could be that the, uh, let's see, the need might change here because we might read out the length. So remember that we're for, we sort of, in order to deserialize these things, we first need to read the first four bytes, which tell us how long the rest of the payload is. And then we need to uh, read the rest of the payload. So that's why need is initially set to four, because initially we just need the length. Um, actually, let's we can just do this separately, I guess. Yeah, it gets a little bit. Unfortunate. Um, I don't really want to replicate this code. So the the silly way to replicate this is we then do this. Um, so initially the need is four, then the need is however long the length is. So four plus this. Um, I guess we could do, and then we do the whole thing again. But see how this duplicates a lot of code that we don't really want to do. Um, and so therefore, what we're going to do is uh, need is going to be uh, if self dot inbox dot len minus self and start is greater than four, then we know a length, we know how much we need. Otherwise, it's gonna be four. So in this case, it's going to be, mm, we're gonna read out the length. Uh, um, and then it's gonna be length plus four, right? So if we already have the length, then how much we're gonna need to read is gonna be length plus the payload size. Otherwise, we're gonna at least need to read the length. Uh, and now here in the case where we, in the case where we truncate, trun 
in, ca in the case where we do get some number of bytes, we're going to have to check if um, self.inbox.land minus self.instart. I really want this to go away. Uh, where's Packetizer? FN then. Self dot inbox dot len minus self dot instart. Self dot in len. Yeah. Um, so if we, if the number of bytes that we have available to us is now greater than four and the need is not equal to four then we parse out the length and then we set need plus equals length right so now basically what this is saying is um we're going to keep reading until we get the length. And when we get the length, we're going to increase how much bytes we need so that we keep reading. And so this while loop is going to continue until we do, in fact, have a full request available to us. Um, and at that point, we now know that need is set to length plus 4. Um, I guess here, if n is equal to 0, we'll have to deal with that separately. So that's if the incoming connection has been closed. Um, and now what we want to do is uh, remove the, well, we want to skip the length field when we start to decode. Uh, we also, then we read the XID and then we skip the XID. Um, and then we want to parse what's left, which is basically going to be uh, where we started uh, plus how much we read minus the length minus the XID, right? Because the need is from the very beginning of the buffer, so what where instart was. Um, but then we've removed the length and the XID, so we don't actually want to read those out. And that's what we're going to end up parsing. Um, so that's going to be the response. Uh, in theory, this should have a question mark. And then what we now need to do is self in start in start plus equal need minus four minus four. And then we will return async ready sum r. Right, so at this point we successfully read out an element and now we can return, um, now we can return that element. Now, uh, there's a little bit of, bit of tricky here, like this is going to end up doing some copying, but let's just not deal with that right now. Um, we also want if self dot uh, in start is equal to self dot uh, inbox dot len, then self inbox clear and self in start is zero. So this is just so that we don't end up accumulating more and more memory. Um, great. So the only way in which this stream can stop yielding elements is if the connection to the server went away. Um, and in that case, what we want to return is async ready, uh, okay, async ready none. Um, now, in this case, we might want to add some debug information like, um, uh, like, if there were things left in the buffer, and then it was an unexpected shutdown. Um, so in fact, one way we can do this is, um, if the, if there are bytes left in the buffer, then we want to return an error. 
question is, of course, what is that error going to be? Uh, in fact, we're going to just uh, do bail. So bail is a macro from the failure crate that just produces an error, which is what we want in this case. Bail with uh, connection closed with device left in buffer. All right, so the, now we have a way to distinguish between the case when the server closed, when the connection went away, when there were no more elements either, like add an element boundary, and the server went away in the middle of sending a response. Um, and what treating one as an error and one as the stream ending is probably what we want to do. All right, so we now have a stream that goes both ways. And so what we want the handshake to do is it is going to... Um, Quest is going to make a request connect. And we now know that that has a bunch of fields, like so. Don't know what those are going to be yet, but let's, so let's set them all to zero for the time being. This is going to be a vec. Um, this is going to be a packetizer new on top of the stream. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to, ooh, that's a good question. Uh, if you have a sync, where's my sync docs? So remember the packetizer implements both stream and sync. Sync is for sending things to the server, stream is for receiving things. And so in this case, when we do a handshake with the server, we've now sort of popped up a level, right? So we used to be looking at the protocol implementation. Um, oh, actually, come to think of it. We haven't written response parse either, but um, we used to look at the protocol version and now we're sort of stepping one step up to the, the Zookeeper library trying to connect. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna con construct a connection request it's going to send that on the on the packetizer sync and then it's going to read back from the uh, it's going to read back the response from the server so for the sync what we're going to do is we're going to where's my where are the list of methods i want send yeah so it's going to send the request and then what send gives back, so send is a future whose item is, whose item is the sync. So it's uh, in future land, usually if you try to send on some channel, then the channel will be consumed by the send until the future resolves, which is sort of how you want things to work, right? Like uh, imagine you have a TCP stream. If you send some bytes on it, and, and you get a future back for when those bytes have been written, you don't want to be able to keep using the TCP stream as well because then you would have two writers to the same stream. So instead, the way um, async write handles this, or, or at least the way futures in general handle this, not actually for TCP sockets, but in general, is that um, when you try to send something, the, the send future consumes the sync you're sending into. And then when the send completes, you get it back. So that's why this and then is given a stream back. Um, and now, of course, now that we sent something to the server, we now want to read back. And the way we're going to do that is um, because we know that the, the Zookeeper connection, the packetizer, um, also implements stream. So we are going to then call, um, if you look, there's a lot of things on stream. But basically, the thing we want is uh, into future into future uh, so into future if you call that on a stream normally a stream is sort of like iterator so it just keeps yielding more and more elements in this case we only care about the next one so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, call into future which is a future that resolves to the next item and the stream whenever an item is available um, so if we look at into future that implements future for stream future uh, the item that we get back is uh, an option item and the stream. So the response here is going to be an option response, and the stream is going to be the packetizer. Um, 
And so if uh, response dot is none, that's bad. Uh, otherwise, this is going to return a. Actually, this can just be a map. So that's going to give back a zookeeper. That zookeeper is going to have a like a packets or a connection zk. So our zookeeper we now know is going to be over some s, and it's going to hold internally a connection which is going to be a packetizer over that stream s. Um, it's probably going to have some other things too. It's I don't know quite what yet, um, but at the very least, this is sort of the basic way in which we're going to set this up. We can just do this directly. And so this is, is now a future that will eventually resolve into a Zookeeper connection instance um, that holds a packetizer internally. Um, so now, of course, the, the last thing in theory that we need for this to all work out is that we're going to have to be able to parse the response, right? So this will now indeed send a connection request. And the question is, what do we get back? Um, so we're going to have a response. And we're going we're gonna to have a response type similar to the request type. And we're going to have a parse method on that. So we can probably split proto into our request and response. Uh, so let's do. We're going to move to proto mod. And we're going to open request.rs. And request is going to have this and also this. I think I want the sync and stream implementation to just be in proto, probably. Because um, the other things are going to get pretty large, whereas the sync and stream implementations probably won't change that much in size. Um, so response is going to be pretty similar to a request in that it will be just be an enum. Uh, and it'll be whatever we get back from connect. So this is just going to be a connect. Um, and similar to what we had for requests, we're also going to have, ooh, this is just R. Uh, similar to what we have for request, we're going to need some kind of parse method. In our case, um, we could implement parse. So there's a parse trait in the standard library. Um, I don't think I actually want to do that. I think I just want to do this for now, at least. Um, Super. So uh, the reason this has to be super is because we want to be able to call this this method serialize into from our proto mod. Um, if it were just fn, it would only be available from this file, which is not what we want. Uh, and what do we call this? We call this parse. Uh, so parse takes a buffer. Um, so some u8 buffer. Uh, and at least in theory, gives back a response. Um, it will probably actually be a result. Uh, result response or a failure error. Because it could be that what we get from the server is like malformed in some way, in which case we want to have a way to report that. Um, and so now the question is, how do we parse responses? Well, our string reader, buffer reader. It's a good question. Let's see what this does. So connect request uh, just creates one of these. Try read buff. What does try read buff do? So try read buff. Um, uh, 
Well, that doesn't really help as much. Let's look at the Lua implementation. Um, so, dissect client, as far as I understand, is when the client sends something, this is how it dissects it. So notice here, we recognize the, the length being the first bytes, the XID being the next four, and the uh, opcode being the next four. Dissect server is probably the next method we might guess. Uh, also a length, also an XID, uh, request XIDs, request type. Okay, so it looks like the response there, um, it looks like the response to a connect or the response to any request is actually uh, dependent on the s server's current state. So this makes me think that um, the server is not, does not allow you to multiplex requests and responses on the same connection, because it seems like there's a state of what did the client last ask for for this XID. Could of course be that different XIDs are multiplexed. Okay, so what this means is, in theory, if we know that we're expecting a, re um, uh, a connect response, we should just give that. Although this is a little weird, because it means that our stream doesn't have a way to know what it should return. In particular, uh, I don't think it reads an XID back. See, that's a good question. So the response seems to always have a length. It does always have an XID. And then for the other kind of responses, this is there are a bunch of other fields as well that are always included. Hmm. So, so here's the, the downside of us putting uh, connect and response in the same enum as the others, is that the, the connect response has actually has very different fields, whereas all the other connect responses share, at the very least, these fields. Um, So maybe, um, yeah, no, I think I want it this way anyway. Um, but it does mean that there's actually no XID that comes back. It's just length and then payload. Um, and the way we can tell what the response is, is by which request was sent. So I think this means that the response type is just dictated by the request type. Um, which to me suggests really that the packetizer should keep track of last sent, uh, off code. Uh, what operation are we waiting for a response for? Is it going to be an option opcode, I guess? No, it's going to be an opcode. Uh, sent is going to be a... No, it's going to be an option. Uh, because remember that... Um, when you send a connection request, a connection request does not actually have an opcode. Awesome. And so this means that when you start send, uh, then what we're going to do is self dot uh, last send. Well, this is also a little weird. I think last sent actually has to be a vec dequeue. 
because um, the way we've set up this interface is you can actually have multiple requests in flight, right? You would you would push a bunch of requests and then you would uh, the stream would resolve each one in turn. Um, so I think this would be. Yeah. Collections back DQ. It's a little sad for this to be a DQ. But so this basically means that every time we um, send another request, we push its opcode. And every time we receive a request, we pop the, or we shift from the front of the queue, which request that response must be in response to. Um, so this means the last sent is initially going to be a vec dq new. Um, last sent dot pushback uh, item dot opcode. So this means that on request, uh, we're also going to have a pub super opcode actually no it's in here uh, it's gonna just match on self and if it is a request connect it's gonna be an opcode off uh, is it guaranteed to be responded in order I don't actually know so this is one of the problems with the protocol being so poorly, um, so poorly uh, documented. I suspect that that's true. Yeah, so you both asked the same question. Um, so remember, one thing we could do is we could enforce that you can only send or receive. Um, this is totally something that we could set up in the API that in fact uh, it's not a stream or a sync it's just a future where you send a request and you get a response the reason I sort of wanted it to be a stream is so that you could have multiple requests pending um, but it's sort of like the, in a sense you're you're making a good observation that if it is in fact um, a send a request get a response kind of API then we shouldn't really use a sync or send we should just make the whole thing be a future that uh, serializes the request and then reads the response and then returns. Um, that's a good question. I wonder, so this is one of the problems with the protocol being so poorly documented. Um, leader activation doesn't really help us. That definitely doesn't help us. The, the real question would be this XID. So in theory, um, we could have an XID per request or something, which might let us have multiple outstanding requests. Um, the reason I suspect that it supports this multiplexing is because you have the set watches thing. So um, if we look at the zookeeper thing here, uh, one thing you can do with zookeeper is you can set up a watch. Uh, where is it? Um, so a watcher. Where is this watch? Um, yeah, you can basically set up a thing that should be notified whenever a given path changes. So when a, basically when a key changes. Uh, and this to me suggests that you must be able to send, the server must be able to send us things even when we didn't ask for something. Um, hmm. In fact, let's look at what that gives us. So um, if we go back to the zookeeper class, give me source the zookeeper. So where is the thing that? Okay, so a request um, is sent on that channel. 
sends the request. It and then it just receives a response. Although the uh, yeah, no, see here. So he creates, in this case, the at least the author of the old library sets up a new transmit and receive channel for every request, and then the response comes back on that channel. Um, so this does suggest to me that you could have multiple things in flight. Of course, the the way one one way in which we could make this concrete. Uh, without guaranteeing anything about the order uh, with the ID until the response with the same ID get back. Yeah, so, so one way we could do is just keep a, a mapping, although it doesn't look like there are request IDs in this setup, right? Unless these X IDs are that. Um, but that's not really well defined. Uh, yeah, it's sort of unhelpful because this X ID... I guess that could be transaction ID. So if it's transaction ID, that suggests that you could have multiple XIDs in flight. Um, actually, let's see how XID is incremented. Um, XID is just request. Oh, that's an helpful. Um, self dot xid ah okay so it does look like xid is a per transaction id so this means that every request does have it its own xt uh the current project is writing a library an asynchronous library for zookeeper for apache zookeeper uh the aws bot instances is still a library that's out there i haven't done any work on it for a little while. Um, there are a bunch of uh, videos on YouTube of recordings of past um, past streams around it. So you might want to check those out if that was a project you thought was interesting. OK, so this does suggest that every transaction has its own ID, um, which means that um, it might be that we, ah, here's what we want to do. OK, I got it. So uh, I think we still want the packetizer, because the packetizer the packetizer is the way in which you send and receive things through the server, right? So imagine that it does not, it doesn't really care what the XID is, nor what the opcode is. Uh, ah, here's what we want to do. Okay, so sorry, here's what I'm thinking. Um, the stream is going to take requests. What the, what the, uh, I'm thinking we sort of wanted uh, a demuxer here. So um, at the lowest level, what you want to do is you send requests to the server and you get byte chunks back with an XID. Um, and then it's up to the server to look at which future should I resolve now that I got these, bat, um, these bytes back. So the way this is going to be set up is when you send a request, what you get back is a future for that request. And so internally, what then happens is that request is sent on the sync. That's the packetizer sync. Um, and then at some point, the packetizer will get a response for, um, for that future. Yeah, that's totally the way this should be. OK. Uh, The question is whether XIDs have to be strictly monotonic. Hmm, that's a good question. Okay, so, so here's the way that would work. Uh, this would be a hash map, I guess, from I32 to a uh, futures 
unsync one shot sender an opcode code and a sender response. So the idea here would be that you, um, the whole packetizer is really a future where you can queue up requests and then you just have to keep pulling it. Uh, and as you pull it, the appropriate other futures will also be woken up. Yeah, I think that's the way we want to do this. All right, that's gonna change the design a little bit, but I think it's gonna be for the better. Um, So we're no longer going to implement sync or send or sorry, or stream. What we're going to do is we're going to have a, uh, we're going to impl future for packetizer s, uh, where s is async read and async write. Uh, the item is going to be nothing. The error is going to be a failure error. And then if we look at what's the reload future. And so the idea is that poll is going to both send things that are outstanding and read back things that are results. Um, and then in addition, we'll have a, uh, I guess we can, we could call it start send. Um, so there'll be a separate method on, uh, on packetizer for queuing up additional items. In this case, an item will be a request. Uh, actually it will be a request and a Unsync one shot sender response. Right, so the idea here is that if you have a packetizer, you can sort of, you can enqueue a request. Uh, and the thing you enqueue is both a request and where to send the response. Yeah. And then packetizer is also going to implement future in the sense that uh, you can keep pulling it to try to, oh, actually, better yet. Instead of this giving that, this gives you back a future where the item is a response and the error is a failure error. Beautiful. And then uh, this is going to be, this is going to make a channel that is going to send the response on. Whether this is sync or unsync, I'm not entirely sure yet, but we'll stick with one. Um, right, so self.reply dot insert. Uh, that's going to be XID is going to be some number. So the XID, and then we're going to register uh, item dot opcode and the transmit channel. And then we're going to return the RX channel. Does, it, does this make sense? So you have a, on a packetizer, oh, gonna create. on the packetizer you have a way of enqueuing a request and that gives you back a future that will respond when that request finished. Uh, uh, unimplemented is a, a macro from the standard library. It's really handy. It basically panics if you ever end up calling it. You can also do like unimplemented, I have not done this yet or whatever but usually unimplemented is sufficient. Um, right, so the reason we want Packetizer to implement future is because 
um, you need to keep polling it for it to keep doing reads and writes. Um, and at some point, if the connection breaks down, then that's also when that future would resolve. So I think what we're going to do here is that, um, ooh. every time poll is called, we want to both try to write and to read. Uh, so we want to try to write out any buffered requests. Uh, and we want to try to write out buffered. Try to uh, read out more responses. Um, now, in order to make ourselves a bit more sane, uh, we're actually going to split these into two methods. So we're going to have a poll write. And we're going to have a poll read. And neither of them are actually going to yield anything. Like so, so notice that these are basically unchanged from the way they looked. Uh, wait, that means the response has to carry an XID, right? Or am I completely blind? Because otherwise, how would we know which uh, response to pair it with? OK, yeah, there is an XID in the response. So I was wrong down here. Uh, give me back my XID. Um, down here somewhere. So the idea here would be that um, at this point to do uh, oh, interesting. So here we're gonna uh, find the waiting request. This is going to be uh, off code and tx is going to be self dot reply dot remove and then the xid uh, and then I guess this is probably going to be a What response doesn't have opcode? Uh, so yeah, so you're right. So responses don't have opcodes, but um, but I was worried they don't have XIDs either, but they do. In fact, even connect responses do have XID. So that's good. Um, find the waiting request future. Uh, yeah, so here we probably return an error if XID was unknown. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to parse this, give it the opcode code that the request was made with. Um, and then we're going to do a tx.send. And we're going to send that response. And then we're going to just do async ready. Uh, I guess... We don't really want it to be ready, do we? We want... Uh, 
a good question. I think we actually want this to just be a giant loop. While I think I want an outlen as well. So we need to we need to make sure that we always keep we need to keep pulling the underlying streams, otherwise we won't get notified when new data is available. Um, so while outlen not equals zero then this and then that and here we're going to do uh This is just going to be a loop. So the reason this has to be a loop is because um, imagine that we read one request and then just returned. The problem is there might still be a request sitting in our buffers and the and the future would never resolve. Like we'd never end up getting to that future because we wouldn't need we wouldn't know that we need to pull again because the underlying stream might not have any more data for us. Imagine the server sends us two complete responses and then closes the channel. We read and we return the first one. How does the caller know that they should pull us again? They don't because the stream isn't ready. The stream doesn't have any data on it. Uh, and so this is why uh, in general, when you call poll, it should do as much work as it can do without blocking. And that is basically what we're now telling it to do. Um, so notice that this is not an infinite loop because if we do a try read here, so we do a poll read, if that returns not ready, then we return immediately from, from the loop, which is indeed the behavior you want. Are opcodes Zookeeper's way to call some remote functions on it? Yeah, basically. So opcodes are the type of a request um, is the way, to, the way to look at it. All right, why is this? Uh, it I think this will actually never return something. I think we can do this, but it might not work. 157. What? Uh, did I do something silly? I must have. So in Q and the, oh. No. What did I miss? I have a bracket problem here somewhere. There. <clears throat> Yeah, so the, the idea now is that we keep track of all the XIDs we've sent, what opcode the request in that XID was for, and where to send the response when we've parsed it. And now this is going to be a hash map new. Actually, let's just make this a default. Default. Um, hmm. Why is it? Oh. Uh, request opcode should be pub super. Uh, 55 should be a spawn. Actually, this should probably just do a pub view pub. Create use request request and response response because we're gonna want to use those outside of here. Cannot find big endian. That is true. That is because it's called big endian. 
what else? Uh, oh, I'm probably going to need a bunch of these uses in request and in response. Uh, yeah, I'm probably not allowed to do that either, am I? Oh, and parse now takes an opcode. Code, which is going to be a super uh, request opcode. All right. So the idea now is that on the packetizer, you get to enqueue things, they give you futures back, and as long as the packetizer keeps being run, we're all good. Uh, of course, we're going to have to create new XIDs, which I think is just going to be as simple as to do uh, XID is a U size, and XID is going to be self.xid plus one, and self.xid plus equals one. Actually, it's just going to be this. Probably gonna complain for this. That's fine. We'll never actually get to that type. Um, all right. So poll. What poll is going to do is it's going to call self dot poll read. Uh, then it's gonna go self dot poll write. It has to call both because um, uh, even if we so imagine that both a read socket and a or both the read end and a write end of a socket is ready. If we just called poll read, then we wouldn't be woken up to write again. So we need to make sure that we do both. Um, and so I think calling both here is just fine. We if there is an error, we want to return it. Um, if either of these return not ready, that's fine too. So I think we can just do this. Uh, if let match RW, uh, if they are both async ready, uh, if they're both async ready, then we also return async ready. Uh, although that should basically never be the case. Ah, that's the case. So a write can be... Yeah, so write would, would return ready if, um, if it's written out everything and flushed it. Read would return ready if the s incoming stream has been closed. So... Uh, yeah. Uh, so if both of them are ready, then we return. Then we resolve the packetizer's future because there are no more responses coming in, and the incoming socket has been closed. At which point, there's no point in trying to send anything more. Um, if the incoming socket has been closed, and the outgoing socket is not, who knows what we even do in that case? I think it, just in all other cases, we do um, okay async not ready. You could imagine that if the incoming reply channel was closed, but the outgoing channel was not, then we return an error. Because you could never get a response to those futures. Um, but I think we will just not do that. Uh, actually, we do have to do that. So in this case, we really want to notice that um, fail. Uh, outstanding requests, but response channel closed. What are we missing? Uh, 95. 
Yeah, this is going to be a failure error. This is going to be a failure error. And source lib. Ooh. 16. Right, this is now over a stream. Uh, connect is going to give you a zookeeper uh, over a Tokyo net TCP stream. It's going to be the same. Ah, no. This will take any S. That's so many errors. Uh, Oh, that's so sad. I can't read bytes from, I guess I need a cursor. It's too bad. Um, found IO error, expected failure error. I mean, those we can deal with. Um, I guess the, the next thing that we want to do on sort of the low level is that we want to parse responses. So here, I think basically what we want to do is match on the opcode and then parse appropriately. Um, in this case, we don't really really have the connect response. And the connect response, what does the connect response have? Um, where's our thingy? Connect response. Connect response. So a connect response ooh, is one of these. I don't want any of these to be pub, at least not at the moment. What does that even mean? Is handled as I32? Uh, OK, let's just make it an I32 then. Yep. And so we're going to match on the opcode. Now, one thing that's a little awkward here is there's actually not an opcode for connecting, uh, as far as I can tell. So auth is actually used for authing. I saw this somewhere that uh, auth. Yeah, there's this add auth thing. And that uses the opcode auth. So I don't know if there's actually an opcode for connecting. Um, let's see whether there's a here. No. Huh, that's a good question. So I wonder whether what we want to do is actually invent our own opcode. Because it's not actually going to get sent, right? So we have here opcode, I think we want this to just return connect, and then I want connect to be like minus 100. Uh, so we're going to match the opcode. If it is uh, here, I'm actually going to do that. use that. Um, so if we get an op, if we are deserializing a response to an opcode connect, then we know that what we should do is construct one of the uh, connect responses. And a connect response is made like this. Nice. Uh, now, in order for us to use the read methods, it turns out that you can't actually do a read straight from a buff. And that makes a lot of sense, because um, imagine that we do a, a read i32 from the reader or from the buff in this case. And then we do another read i32. Unless we have some other state to keep track of this, the second read would just read from the beginning of the buff again. Uh, and that's why uh, just a plain buffer does not um, does not implement read. However, uh, no, that's not what I want. Uh, read. 
IO read. So if you look at IO read, it's implemented for a bunch of different things. In particular, read is implemented for a reference to a U8. But we have to look at it a little bit deeper in that read requires a mute self. So it requires a mutable reference to an immutable slice. In particular, we can do reader is at mute. Uh, reader is uh, buff mute reader. And I think that will work. Could be wrong. So what this will do is the reader is going to change the slice so that it points later and later as you keep reading. Um, what is read buffer? Oh, that's right. Yeah, so for vectors, you basically read out um, a length field first. Hmm. So how do we want to encapsulate that nicely? So w one way we could do this is um, just add a trait read buff. Uh, implement read buff for R, where R implements read. And this is gonna, uh, I think this is basically, we can just probably copy the method from here. Do basically the same thing. Uh, read from that one. I guess we'll probably want the string reader as well. Um, but yeah, notice that all this is really doing is just reading out a length. Uh, and then it reads that many things from the underlying stream. Um, and so in our case, this should be all, we need, all that's needed. Um, what? Expected two type arguments. What do you mean expected two type arguments? Oh, result, right. Uh, this is gonna be a failure error. We're gonna want to go through and uh, tidy up our errors a little. Yeah, so notice that uh, Proto 149, we have sort of the same issue that it's saying, I can't read an I32 from what's just a buffer, right? So really what we do is here, oh, it's gonna be a little bit awkward. Uh, here, we're gonna have let buff is so, uh, self, Buff is going to be a reference into this that lasts from here to self uh, in start plus need. Um, and buff is mutable. And so this means that we can now read from buff. And that this can just be plus equals need down here. Um, right, so the length we already read out up here. 
Although we can technically read it again down here, I suppose. Off. Read that. XID, read that. And then this is going to be uh, the rest of buff. So this is kind of neat. So uh, because the uh, the implementation of read for a mutable reference to a slice is basically that after it's read, it, it changes the buffer or that it changes the slice to point only to the things that it hasn't read yet. And so that means we don't have to keep track of how far we read, which actually makes for slightly nicer code. Um, Yeah, so this doesn't actually work because this, um, I think we need to do like this, which I don't know whether it'll let us do. Oh, yeah, how about that? 39 need plus equals length. Uh, expected use size found i32. is not found for S at line 122. Ah, right. Uh, it's because we've written packetizer to not actually require anything. Whereas pull read and pull write are only available where S is async read and async write. Uh, we could add these as where's actually to the where s is async write, and this is where s is async read. <sighs> 148. Um, expected async found result. Right, I already have the question mark, so I don't need that. Oh, it's so warm. Whew. Uh, 119, this is the same thing where I need to give it a mutable reference so that it no so that it can try to advance the pointer. Uh, 110. Uh, not there. There from. Actually, I guess here I could get give context. But let's not do that for now. 100, try ready, expected U size, found ASIC. Um, oh, that's a little weird. Because it shouldn't care. So why does it care? Expected U size found async. So write will return the number of bytes written. Whereas this function is supposed to return uh, async unit. So the question is why does this not I mean, in theory, you could just get around this with uh, with this uh, async ready and return n async not ready return okay async not ready. I mean, that's basically what uh, try ready d sugars to. Uh, so the question is why that wouldn't work. One or two. Expected U size. Found async. Oh, do I need to use pull right instead of right? It could totally be it. Uh, async right. Yeah, I do need to use pull right, so that's why. 
So uh, write is just the, the right system call from, uh, sorry, the, the right thing that's in the right trait. Whereas I actually want the poll version so that I can use try ready. Whereas the right one, so if you look at async write, um, notice how it basically says that the write method from the right trait follows the following contract. Whereas poll write is just one that sort of uh, encapsulates this this contract in a poll based API. So let's me use try ready. Um, here, wait, that's not what I meant to do. Expected i32 found u size on like 89. Uh, yes, so that has to be as i32. Uh, no length found. Oh, len. Uh, 78. Dot XID. I want that to be an I32, not a U size. All right. Uh, 45. Should be reply. 19. Oh, it seems like we're getting closer. So response for some reason, ambiguous associated tie. Oh, this is a connect. Okay. Uh, line 42. Wait, how is this ambiguous? Wait, response is not a trait. Response is an enum. Oh, okay, fine, fine, fine. I'm so confused. Why is it saying that response connect is ambiguous? And 42. That is what, oh, I didn't rename it. That's why. That's a terrible compiler error message. Someone should fix that. Um, okay, we're almost there, I think. Source lib 20. So this is now complaining that it's not actually getting an error. So this, um, Of course, we'll, we'll, uh, we can clean up some of these. So these, for example, could be then our, our context uh, and then fail to connect to Zookeeper. I think it's technically like this. Um, zookeeper, Zookeeper, sadly, but that's how it's spelled. Uh, 22. Um, do I really need to do this? That's kind of silly. Yeah, so the, the problem here is I have a result where the error type is IO error, and I've told it that I'm going to return a failure error. Uh, I need to do this maybe. Oh, it's failing somewhere else now. Let's get rid of some of these warnings. So response does not need write bytes x. Does not need futures. Does not need hash map. Does not need write or Tokyo. What else? Uh, or Tokyo prelude. That makes a lot of sense because there's nothing async in response. My guess is the point is the same for response does not need read bytes because it's just going to write stuff protomod does not need tokyo does not need self and write and does not need oh, that's what it needs uh, response um, that needs io read or 
quest, line 67. Um, did you mean request connect? Is that not what I wrote? Oh. Right. Uh, lib cannot find packetizer. So that's going to be... So it has a mod proto, right? Yeah. So we're going to have a mod proto, and this is going to have a proto packetizer. It's going to be a proto packetizer. Send. Right. So uh, now we're getting back into the, the fact that we changed packetizer makes this a little annoying now because um, you now sort of need to, we need to have a way to drive the packetizer. Um, you, you can think of this as like, whenever you want to send a request now, you have to enqueue the thing on the packetizer and then you need to drive the packetizer forward so that the response eventually comes back on the reply chat, the future you get back on the packetizer. Um, so it's going to look something like this where you do enqueue request and that gives you a future. Um, and then the question now is, we're going to have something like uh, foof dot. Uh, I guess this is just going to be this dot uh, map that. But of course, the problem here is if we in fact wrote the code like this, ZK would now be dropped, which means the packetizer would go away and would not be driven any further. But it's a future that needs to continue to be resolved. Um, so if you look at this now, this uh, I guess we can make it compile just because uh, it's not going to matter a lot. Um, this bug is still going to be there. Uh, this does have to be self. This has to be self. And then it's going to complain 159. Uh, that's fine. And that to do. Uh, where is it complaining? 58, it's complaining because, uh, it's because this failure error from, um, right, so this now maps just to a response. I guess we could move the ZK into here uh, just to demonstrate the issue. Um, 34 read only is going to be false. Um, 21 complains because expected type parameter. Ah. Also a terrible error. Uh, cannot infer it's for B. Yeah, so this is why I'm just gonna failure error from for now. Uh, 39, guaranteed to always get a response there. Uh, sorry, I'm, right now I'm just going through the, all the errors and fixing them up. Um, just so that when we do start tackling the actual problem in source lib, um, I can talk about it without, without having all the other errors get in the way. Uh, all of these others are unimplemented. Uh, compiler error driven development. Yeah, I know. I, I actually really like it. I think it's a, I think it's a pretty good way to, to work through your program, but I, maybe I'm alone in that. Uh, irrefutable let pattern. Why is it complaining about that? Uh, requests. Fine, I'll add another request type. Foo. Should not be necessary. Unimplemented. And unimplemented. 
Oh, almost there. Proto mod 86. Uh... Great. All right, so now we get a bunch of warnings, but see that this whole thing now compiles, right? But um, let me see if I can make this problem clear. So the packetizer is a future that deals with, uh, that needs to be pulled in order to send bytes to the network and read things back. When you enqueue something, all that means, for, remember from when we wrote enqueue, is that you serialize the thing and put it in a buffer. But that won't be sent on the wire and your response won't be read until we drive that future forward, right? And so that's why this, uh, this, uh, um, this packetizer, unless you drive it, this request that you enqueue here, the future you get back will never be resolved. Because remember, it gets resolved when the response channel is sent on. It's only sent on when the server has sent us a response that we parsed. And the server will only send that when we send the request. None of those things will happen unless the packetizer is being pulled. Um, so, so there are a couple of different ways to ensure that this will happen. The way we're going to do this is we're going to use the new uh, Tokyo Runtime API and basically just say Tokyo spawn ZK. So spawn, if you spawn a future, it means that it'll be on the the pool of thread that Tokyo, the Tokyo Runtime is going to make sure that it keeps pulling. You can only call this from within the context of a future. Uh, luckily, we know that we're in the context of a future because we're already in this and then of the TCP stream. Um, the issue, of course, is that spawn is going to move the packetizer. So at this point, we don't have a way to enqueue future requests. We don't have a, a handle to the packetizer anymore. Um, and so what we're going to have to do is... Um, hmm, let enqueuer is going to be zk enqueuer and cure and cure dot send request don't move and cure and enqueuer is a really hard word to type Wow. Um, so let me see if I can explain why this happens or what we're really doing here. Uh, Enqueuer. Um, so the idea here is that we're going to spawn the packetizer on the Tokyo runtime. So that means that Tokyo is going to make sure that we keep pulling it. And then we're going to have the packetizer expose some way to send it things so that we can enqueue additional requests without holding on to the entire packetizer. Now, there are a couple of different ways you can do this. Um, I'm going to do this with a, in a very straightforward way, just with a, um, just with a queue. Well, just, just with a channel. Here we can choose whether we want to use a sync or an unsync channel. I think I want the channel to be sync probably. Um, so we're going to add a channel here that's going to be incoming requests. Uh, Rx, that's going to be a futures sync MPSC uh, receiver of request. Uh, next XID to issue. Ooh. Um, I think I actually want the enqueuer just be returned when you make the packetizer. In fact, here's an even better API. This just returns a sync MPSC sender request. 
It does a Tokyo spawn. Uh, so that way, this does the Tokyo spawn for you. Uh, I should probably just import this, shouldn't I? Uh, use future sync MPSC. Um, so it's going to be an MPSC. This is going to be an MPSC. Uh, unbounded, probably. Um, Rx is going to be the Rx, and it returns the Tx. Document that it calls Tokyo Spawn. So uh, one thing to be aware of is that when you're using the Tokyo Run and Tokyo Spawn methods, Tokyo Spawn assumes that there's currently a runtime running and that it is within the context of that runtime. So once you start using these methods, you are essentially adding a dependency on Tokyo that's sort of hidden from view. Um, so you need to be sure to document the fact that, like in this case, Packetizer New does require that you're in the context of a runtime. Otherwise, it will not work. Um, I don't think this is particularly onerous. It's just something to be aware of. Uh, this will be an unbounded receiver. All right. Uh, and now there will not actually be an enqueue method anymore. Instead, what we'll have is uh, a fn poll enqueue. Also gonna take one of these. Ah, but how are we gonna give the channel back? That's the reason it's annoying. Um, yeah, we're gonna, gonna have to work around this a little bit. Um, so it's actually gonna get a pair of request and one shot sender response. So remember that we need to we need to give the packetizer a way to send the response back as well. So the channel that we send back, we could just do this uh, one shot uh, sender response. Um, while we could do this, I probably want to wrap up that up in a slightly nicer API, um, but we'll deal with that in a second. Um, we're gonna have this poll and queue business. And what poll and queue is gonna do is it's gonna be very similar to the poll write and poll read, except in that. Uh, where's my, oh no, did I not copy it? Uh, in that it is simply going to, it is simply going to um, poll the thing that enqueues or that, um, uh, that receive the, the channel we have that receives incoming requests and then just serialize them. So it's basically the same as what we used to do when the enqueue method was called, but it, that process is going to be asynchronous as well. Um, so in this case, it is simply be uh, while, actually, I guess, uh, it's going to be a loop. It's going to be a let uh, item is self dot rx dot poll uh, is going to be a try ready on poll. Uh, and I guess one question here is what if it errors? So I think this one in particular is going to be a uh, MPSC. Uh, what is the error type for that? That's a good question. Um, docs.rs futures. Where is our... So in this case, we have a... Why? I don't want 0 0.2. Um, where's sync? Sync. MPSC. If you have an unbounded receiver, um, 
and you call poll, what do you get? And what's the error type? There is no error type. Right. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to try ready, and that might return an error if there are no more requests coming. Right. So so think of this as. Um, at some point, the sending channel that we ha have in order to enqueue things is going to get dropped. And at that point, we sort of want to disconnect from Zookeeper. Um, now, we don't currently have a good way of doing that, but in theory, um, that would be this method returning an error, saying I couldn't pull the enqueue anymore. Uh, so we'll have to deal with that in the pull method of Packetizer's future implementation. Um, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. Um, so this is going to get an item and a TX. Um, it will simply do this. Well, simply um, forever. So it will keep trying to read things from the NQ channel until it, it, until it would have blocked. So remember that this will not actually loop forever, right? This will loop until the, the uh, NQ channel is empty. Uh, this could be called NQRX, I guess. But, uh, and so this is just going to keep going until then, and then we'll return. And then what we'll do is we'll have our poll implementation. It will do also uh, self poll NQ. And we're going to sort of match. Well, so we're going to match on this. So if this is OK of any sort, then just continue. If this is error, what this means is no more requests will be enqueued. And at that point, what we really want to do is, uh, oops, um, if no more requests are going to be enqueued, then once poll read and poll write have finished, then we really want to um, stop them. Right? Like once poll write is then finished, then we can really just close that connection. I don't know if there's an exit uh, call, but if we look at Rust Zookeeper, is there a drop implementation or something? Self.close. Yeah, close session. Wait, what is create session? I feel like create session is what open is. Let's uh, not invent our own connect and use create session instead. Uh, yeah, so so once th once we hit this uh, this error case and we know there are no more requests coming in, then once pull read and pull write have both returned ready, then what we want to do is then uh, issue a close, and only when that finishes are we done. So um, I guess here we're going to say exiting is false. Uh, oh, exiting is a bool. Exiting is false. Um, and then we're going to say here, if not self exiting, so if exiting is false, is true. True, uh, and then down here, we're gonna have a case where. Wait, why is this complaining? Uh, oh right. Ah. No. Not what I meant to do. Oh, did I? I did something stupid, didn't I? Wait, this seems totally valid. Why is it complaining? Uh, proto line 59. I mean, I must have introduced a syntax error somewhere because it's really unhappy with me, but unexpected token TX. Oh, that's why. Um, Yeah, so when we poll in the future implementation here, um, we're going to set sort of set ourselves to be in an exiting mode. 
and we will only allow ourselves to exit when uh, is here if selves exiting. So it's only if we're exiting that we will let that happen. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we are async not ready because we could still receive uh, we could still receive more more requests, right? Now here uh, there's actually another mode which is when we first enter this case of everything has been flushed, everything has been replied to, and um, uh, oh, actually, I guess, if the, we now want to handle the case of the right channel has been emptied, and we're exiting. I guess that doesn't mean that there are no outstanding features. That's a little awkward. Hmm. Yeah, so the question here is, um, we, we sort of want to know when to send the request to close everything off, right? Um, I don't have a, like we want to send this, um, where is, uh, this close session request. But I think for now, we're just going to not tear down things nicely, even though we, we ought to. But I'm mean, just going to not deal with that for now. All right. How are we in compiling? Uh, response. Right. This is now create session. Um, proto mod is now wait why is it complaining about this expected sender found unbounded sender yeah um, so here I actually want this to be a like an enqueuer so there's gonna be a uh, pub struct or I guess create uh, and cure. So notice how almost all the code we've written is internal abstractions for our library. The external interface is still basically non-existent. But the hope is that most of what we've written here, we can reuse really easily um, on the outside. We now have a, a sort of good driver for running all of our internal futures. Um, so in cure is really just going to be a wrapper around uh, this business. going to be a wrapper around this and we're going to implement on enqueuer. Enqueuer is going to be very straightforward. All it's really going to do is it's going to have a, a function that is enqueue. It takes a request and it returns a impl future items response and error is a uh, failure error. So notice that here um, we're using impl future here just to sort of hide the mechanism we use because we could totally imagine that there's some more efficient way than a, a one-shot uh, future channel maybe to communicate this. But we don't really want the user to know. All we want them to know is that you get back a future that will eventually um, evaluate to the, the response that you got. Um, and all this really has to do is a, it all it really wraps around what you gave it is it creates the channel for you. So it does a one-shot channel, uh, and then it does uh, self dot uh, 
zero dot send uh, and it will send a I guess this is unbounded send so this is something that was recently added that I'm very happy about so unbounded senders normally implement sync and remember how sync for the if you call send on a sync it consumes self but for unbounded senders you also have unbounded send which just consumes self by reference um, which is very nice because it means that we don't have to consume the enqueuer. Uh, in this case, we're gonna send uh, the request, which is this, and we will send the transmit channel to send things back on, and then we return Rx. And we will map the error. Uh, so now in lib, um, the enqueuer is gonna be enq so and we will then move the enqueuer into here um, yeah so this is actually going to give you the enqueuer like so this takes a self does not need to be mutable uh, No function new on packetizer. Oh, right. Thank you. Uh, proto mod. All oh, right. Uh, and around that. The other thing that's nice about this is the enqueuer is not tied to the type of the stream. So you can make a packetizer and pass around enqueuers without the enqueuers having to know um, how we're communicating with Zookeeper. Um, this might not matter in like many other contexts, but I think that's going to turn out to be nice for us for testing in particular. Um, expected option found tuple. Uh, why would that be? So if you have an unbounded receiver, it's very weird. Oh, right. That gives me an option. So we're going to match. Actually, we'll just match on poll. Uh, so poll is going to give us, so we have an unbounded receiver here, right? So when we call poll, what we get back is a, no, it's not at all what we get back. Where's my uh, prelude? Uh, stream. Poll, we get one of these guys. Uh, errors we want to propagate. Uh, if we get an async, actually, I do want try ready. Uh, but if we get an OK uh, item TX, then we return item TX. If we get a none, then we return an error. Um, it's a little weird, actually, because I don't think you can. What? Oh, return. Uh, expected option found results. Expected sender found sender on 98. Uh, it's because this guy has to be a one shot. So I'm using uh, future sync in future instead of futures unsync here so that you can actually have uh, many different threads sending and receiving responses from Zookeeper at the same time. Um, we're going to require that. Oh, that's a little sad, but yeah. Uh, we're going to require that S is send and static. in order to make a new one. Pack 
Ticketizer. Yes. Uh, so the error that happened there was uh, we were trying to call poll write and poll read, and they were lumped in the same impl block. But we actually only require send and static for new because it calls Tokyo spawn. Um, and Tokyo spawn might spawn things on a thread pool, for example. Um, async read is not implemented. Right, um, and I guess here, s where, s needs to implement send, it needs to implement static, it needs to implement async read, and it needs to implement async write. So it needs send and static because we're spawning it, and spawning might happen on a thread pool. It needs to implement async read and async write because we've only implemented future for packetizer when s is async read and async write. Uh, 62, expected failure found nothing. Uh, oh, right. Uh, future. We don't actually get to have this return an error, so that's also a little awkward. Um, the problem here is the packetizer is now sort of running out in some thread pool somewhere. And so if this future errors, um, Tokyo doesn't know where to return that error. And we don't really have a good way of communicating it back. Um, so I think the way we're going to deal with this for now is to, um, is to just map out the error here. Uh, expose this user, this error to the user somehow. I don't actually know that the best way to get this back is. One way might be to, the next time the user tries to, or that, that it just like resolves some future with that error instead. That way we're guaranteed that it gets propagated. Um, I think what we're gonna do for now is just draw the, uh, which isn't great, but. We'll do it for now. Um, stream S. Handshake stream S. That will only work where S is... S is async read and async write. Uh, send... And static. Uh, this needs to use Tokyo. It does not need futures, which is interesting. All right, so 41, what's left? Expected response found tuple. Right does not get the queue, it just gets the response. Uh, and now there's no none. And this now holds, ah, that's great. So this holds an enqueue. Uh, did I make the enqueue pub crate? Yes, indeed. Oh, that's great. So this now alone, ah. This no longer needs to be generic or S, which is also beautiful. Because it means we can do this. And it means we can do this. And it means we can do... I still need to have that. Seven. Handshake is generic over any S. Uh, and 22. Wait, cannot move, oh, un, unbounded send. And that's why it's nice. All right, so in theory, this should connect us the way we want to and uh, make everything happy. Let's just uh, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. Oh, I guess this, maybe? Uh, 
still. Actually, then. No. Format error. Uh, fail to enqueue. This should just never fail. Pretty sure this should just never fail. Because the because we know that our receiver shouldn't be terminating. I guess the way this would fail, so this is um, sending a request to the packet writer failed. This would only fail if the packet writer has gone away. We know that normally the packet writer will keep reading until this channel, the sender goes away. So that it should always be available. So this would be if the packet writer went away and that can happen. Um, Fail to enqueue new request. Uh, that can happen if the, it's true, that can happen if the packet writer goes away. And same here, um, fail to, it's going to be E, fail to request E. Um, Um, the other question here is, oh, I probably want just my own sanity, uh, oops, drive debug cache eek, uh, partial eek, ord, partial ord, uh, and then I want request to be debug and response to be debug uh, proto mod like so So the issue here is that um, this function doesn't actually return a result, right? It returns a future. And I sort of want to say that uh, I want to return a future if this failed. So the way I'm going to do that is um, I'm going to match on this. And if it's, if it's OK, uh, then I think I think the OK from unbounded send does basically nothing. Uh, one sync MPSC unbounded sender result of nothing. Uh, so if nothing happened, then this, and then we're going to use the either uh, future combinator, which is also really handy. Um, so I'm going to use uh, future either. So then either a that or if there's an error, uh, then I want to return either b uh, error format error. I think this is legal. Uh, result dot in, into future. Great. Now it's complaining about a bunch of things, in particular request at 61. Uh, that's fine. Uh, foo, a bunch of unused opcodes, which isn't terribly surprising. N, which is no longer in use. Uh, response, which we're not really using. Although I guess we could print it out now that we're debugging anyway. So this is going to e print line. 
response. Um, proto mod ignores length to 201. Forty-four. That's gone away. So what do we have now? Are there opcodes and cure connection. So connectional zookeepers never used. And result on proto mod two hundred eight. Does a send and doesn't do anything with it. Uh, I think. Okay, so this is, we're trying to send the response to someone who enqueued a response, but the receiver has been dropped. And I think we just want to ignore that failing. If the receiver doesn't care, we don't either. All right, cargo T, run a test. In theory, we now have everything we need to connect into the handshake. And all the other things should actually be a lot more straightforward. Uh, takes one parameter. Source lib. Oh, right. Uh, Rust net. Net. TCP stream. See, I sort of wanted this. That's really the signature I want for connect. Um, the question of course is, how does this choose super each adder? Uh, what's each adder? And can I even get one? Probably not. That's really unfortunate. I just want a nice API where people can uh, find. It will take a socket adder and uh, we're just gonna have to do 127.0.0.1 port 21.81, which is the zookeeper port, dot parse, dot unwrap. All right, how about now? Uh, what? Isn't there a way for me to parse a socket adder? Connect timeout. Does Tokyo have an, I just want some code I can copy paste for connecting. Tokyo. Oh, is that all I need? Connect, and then do this. Great. Uh, line 54. ZK. Uh, block on, I think, is an API we can use. Now, is it a complaining about? Not found in Tokyo. Oh, okay, so Tokyo Run is also a little bit stupid because Tokyo Run takes a future and runs until that future completes, but that future can't return anything. Whereas very often what you want is you want the ability to just use, you want to resolve a future and get its result. But that's not something you can do easily that way. Uh, the way to get around it is you um, create a Tokyo Runtime yourself. Um, Unwrap, and then you do RT block on, I think it's block on all that I want. Maybe not. Could not find runtime in Tokyo. Oh, runtime. And block on, and then RT shutdown on idle. So this is saying keep running until this future res resolves and then shut down once the pool is idle. Um, uh, no unwrap, okay. How about this? Uh, 
Well, that's sort of progress. What is it saying? Failed. Failed to enqueue new request cancelled. Cancelled, you say? So... And Q didn't work. That's interesting. So we presumably get to the handshake part. Uh, about to handshake. Okay, first of all, I want these errors to go away. Uh, variant is never constructed. Request, what is it? Uh, allow uh, Rust, allow enum variance. Variance. Unused. Wow, I cannot spell today. Uh, unused enum variants. I'm gonna guess no. Uh, Allow dead code maybe. Yep, that seems to have done it. And then I don't want, I just want the warnings to go away so that it's easier to read this code. Um, this as well, allow dead code for now. And this foo business. I also want to allow that code. Great. So this still now fails with fail to enqueue new request. Uh, if I run this with no capture, what does it say? About to handshake. Okay, so it, um, it does get to the point where it tries to handshake. It makes the packetizer Um, and so it's the enqueue that fails. Cancelled. Well, I guess we'll have to look at what the packetizer does. So, um, packet packetizer told. And we want to see whenever it decides that it's done, which is this place. Packetizer done. In theory, it shouldn't feel like it was done, right? Yeah, the packetizer is not done. The packetizer is being pulled. So why is it failing to enqueue the new request? Ah. Uh, Proto mod twenty seven. So it's trying to receive the response, and that's been cancelled. So this suggests that the uh, when we send the TX to the packetizer, that TX is simply dropped. So why is that TX dropped? That means we're dropping something from reply, or we're never inserting it into reply. So here, uh, eprintline got request item. So the idea, of course, was that the TX would be stored here. And then that uh, somewhere down here, um, where is the here? Uh, recovering uh, or uh, handling response to XID this uh, with opcode this to the opcode. All right, let's see what we got. 
So it does receive, it receives the request. It does receive the request. The question is why does it then drop the sender? Very good question. Because that's the only place it could be. Removed. So that's a very good question. Why it would um, drop the response. Actually, let me... Um, just if other people want to follow along with the code, I'll make a repo for it. Uh, Tokyo Zookeeper. Note add this. Note add dot. Now, of course, the yeah. So now the code is here. If you want to go see it, so it's at uh, GitHub John Who Tokyo Zookeeper. Um, and so the question now is, why is the receiver being canceled? Um, Given that it's not being removed, it's almost like the packetizer isn't inserting it anywhere. Um, but there's nothing that can fail between these. So it definitely got the request, which means it definitely inserted it here. So why on earth would it go away? Unless, of course, the whole packetizer is dropped. Drop for packetizer. Let's see. I'm not sure why that would be the case either. It is being dropped, so that's the reason it's being canceled. But the question is, why is it being dropped? Uh, Because the packetizer should be returned here. Which means it should be returned here. I mean, we it's true that we're dropping the enqueuer here, but we're not really dropping the packetizer. Because the packetizer is just being... Um, the packetizer is just being spawned onto the Tokyo runtime. I guess... <laughs> I guess it had an error that we just dropped. <laughs> That's what we get for uh, taking shortcuts. All right, let's see. Uh, failed to fill whole buffer. Failed to fill whole buffer. But that shouldn't really be a problem. It should be allowed to not fill the buffer. Uh, hmm. 
So I guess let's uh, dig into this some more. So a print line poll in Q. Um, poll read. I mean, my guess is it's in poll read. All right. So it gets to poll read and then fails to fill the whole buffer. So somewhere here, That's totally what it is. Um, no, though we shouldn't be calling that. So the question is here. I want to know where exactly that happens. I don't think it gives me a backtrace though. Um, yeah, so the issue is specifically that at some point it's trying to read inside this function and instead of just returning wood block, it gets like uh, an error saying that, the, um, that it failed to read the number of bytes. I think the only way that could happen is if we... Uh, is if we use the read i32 API. And so the read bytes x, because we give it all just a slice, it knows that it reach the, reaches the end of the stream, and therefore it would give that error instead of would block, um, which I think means that it gets here. Uh, my guess is it fails in like response parsing or something. Um, yeah, it got there. So I'm gonna guess that it gets here. It did not get there. Um, well, that's interesting. So, I mean, this is the connect response. So maybe the length there is wrong or something. Got here with need equals four. But uh, it seems wrong. Oh, more than or equal to four. Ah, that's pretty silly. More than or equal to four means that we get the length. I got here, still says with four. Um, read more bytes. Yeah, so th this sort of suggests that it's not reading enough data. Read more bytes, read more bytes. Have how many? Self inlet. Shouldn't it be need equals four instead of not equal to four? Uh, where do you think it's not equal to four? Read more bytes have zero. Read more bytes have zero dot here with need equals four. Uh. Oh, yeah, you're totally right. You're totally right. Good catch. It passed. We successfully connect to Zookeeper. You're totally right. Good catch. And let's see what we get back. So we get back a... Look at that. That's something Zookeeper gave us, at least in theory. Don't know why it's uh, read only true. Like these things look a little bit sketchy, but why would it give us a negative session ID? But okay, that's progress. 
let's um, get rid of these god here business. I do probably want to keep in these for a while, but at least this is... Uh, where's the packetizer? I don't want that. Commit. Uh, can connect. Hooray! Get push. Um, so now let's try to run some other operation. So in theory, my hope here at least is that um, writing more operations now should be basically trivial. Uh, I mean, it's probably not going to be, but I want it to be. So we're going to derive um, clone and debug for this. And then we're going to have, if you have a zookeeper, you can, let's see, what's the interface for this crate on Zookeeper? So add like the simplest things we can. Let add create and exists. That seems great. Create, uh, sure. Actually, no, let's make this as simple as we can for now. It will in fact just be this. And it's going to give you back an impl future. Uh, I guess string. I mean, I don't know what's in there, but sure, why not? Failure error. This is one of those places where we probably want a uh, structured error type. Um, and now what this is going to do is it's going to do self dot uh, connection dot in queue. Uh, now we're going to have to define the request. We're going to find, where's our friend? Over here somewhere. Um, so that's connect request, connect response, request header, reply header, create request. Great. So it's going to be a new request type. It's going to be this. Um, and if you're trying to write out a create request, what that's going to look like is path data ACL flags and like all of these are ref we might want to make uh, requests be um, ooh no, let's leave that alone for now um, flags so this is going to be very 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 similar to what we had in uh, had for connect because it's really just going to be, uh, oh, what does it say? Write to. This is uh, some uh, funky stuff going on here. So this is going to be create, create. Um, oh, that's because these are all funky. These are new types. So we have strings and vex of various different types. Ah, so this is why they've got this uh, write to trait. Yeah, I think we want that trait. I think that seems like a good idea. So we're gonna keep this trait. Like so. Um, and there's an impl of write to for u8 for string and for vec t. Like so, um, and then also for ACL, although for now, uh, 
We don't really have this ACL type yet. Do I want this ACL type? Probably do, don't I? Lib, what's an ACL? No, nope. ACL. Oh yeah, I don't want this yet. It's too much stuff. So we're gonna claim that this is actually an empty back um, to do. Right. And so now, um, lm in self dot iter. lm dot write to. Why are there no, oh, t implements write to. Are there any other write to implementations here? Connect request, request header, et cetera, et cetera. That's all fine. Okay, these are all the same. All right, so what this gives us is the ability to do uh, path right to buffer, data right to buffer, ACL right to buffer. So my guess is that uh, the encoding of VEC is just the number of elements first. Yeah, and for string, is this the length of the string first? Yeah, okay, so th these are very straightforward. Um, it's just nice to have a, a convenient um, uh, convenient way to encapsulate it so that we don't have to repeat the same code for writing the length in advance each time. Um, Oh, right, and these all return, I guess, uh, IO result, IO result, IO result, IO result. Yeah, so this is gonna enqueue a request. We're gonna hear, I'm just gonna use proto request create it's gonna have a path which is gonna be path dot into owned we're gonna have data which is gonna be data dot into owned right uh, what else is in a create ACL and flags ACL which is just gonna be a vec for now and flags which is gonna be zero for now Request 108. Wait, bye. Uh, for stir is what I really want. And for that's what I really want. Um, 108. Uh, I want DREF. Why does it not give me DREF? So I guess I'll just do this for tick A for tick A. Back. T. And that's just going to call uh, self dot write to writer. What? about like that wait oh it can't mm. fine uh, evacuate then and then I think maybe I can now get rid of this 
Uh, it's because unit doesn't implement. Yeah, exactly. Unit doesn't implement. And I don't really want to implement write to for unit. Um, seems seems not, not the right thing to do. Um, and response also needs to be able to parse a create response. Create response, which is this apparently a string. Uh, string. Actually, let's do it properly. Um, and that is just a read string. So I guess this is the opposite trait, which we probably also want to borrow from here. Right, and this is very similar to the buffer reader that we already have. Um, like so. And now if we get an opcode, actually here we do have this opcode create, uh, that's gonna give us an okay response, create response, where it's just gonna be response. So notice how usually the, the core protocol things end up looking very similar between uh, async and non-async things. It just what it means when there are errors. Um, but now, uh, comma, 38, this has to be an IO result, this has to be an IO result. I would rather have it be IO result than all these failure errors on methods that are basically IO. So we'll stick to that. Um, it's going to complain about 32 because here. It's going to be an error. Error kind, uh, I guess. I guess a wood block, actually. Read buffer failed. Source lib 55, this should be in two string. Two string, I guess. Yeah, so what I was thinking earlier is we might want requests to have a lifetime so that you don't have to give owned things into it, but it makes it a little annoying with the future um, because you don't actually know um, you're sort of have to, going to have to guarantee that the reference is valid until you read the response, which is a really weird lifetime to have and not one that's uh, um, trivial. Um, but we'll, we'll see how this works out and see if that's nice. Uh, 53, that's going to enqueue and then map. Uh, R if let uh, spawns. So this is one thing that's a little bit annoying. Um, is that uh, sorry? Just finish typing this first. Um, is this case that? you send a request for a create and then you know the response also has to be a create, but the compiler doesn't actually know that this is the case. Um, we could sort of fix this by adding a, a trait bound here saying that a, 
and Q takes any type and returns a future that resolves into that type's resolve type, and then only implement like resolve the resolve type trait for create response for create request. That way you'd be able to pair them up. Uh, but I think this is nicer. That would that would prevent abuse though. I guess um, let's find our proto mod in Q uh, to do maybe. Uh, so the proposal is that we make in Q uh, take a an R a rec and a res uh, self rec takes a rec returns an impl future item is res uh, where uh, rec return, return something like that so we could have a we could have that kind of a bound which would guarantee us that we wouldn't be able to cons to return a different um, response of the one that was requested. Um, so that would be pretty nice. Um, I think for now, uh, I mean, we can do that. I, I'm more trying to figure out whether there's a better way than using unreachable. So I think this pattern bothers, bothers me a lot because it shouldn't be necessary. And this type is going to be mean that in Q is a bit more of a pain to use though because it means that you don't really know what response you're going to get back um, and we wouldn't have this convenient enum type either um, yeah. uh, got a non create response to a create request Spawn 63. Why is this? Oh, create. So now let's. So see how straightforward that was to add? So we're going to do connect and then uh, with the enqueuer. Uh, actually, we're just going to do that. Then we're going to do uh, zk dot in queue. No, zk dot create uh, slash foo. Zero x forty two. That's all I want to write there. That gives me a future, and I'm going to block on that future. Actually, that's not even what I want to do. There's so many ways in which we could do this. Uh, I think. I think what I actually want to do is this. Um, oh, that's another thing that's, no, actually that's fine. So this is gonna give us a ZK and then we're gonna do ZK dot, uh, and uh, here we're gonna do ZK dot create and then path e print line uh, created. Path. Like so. Oh, it did not like that. How about now? Cannot infer type for T. Uh, 
Oh, that's right. 82, it doesn't like... Anyway, let's see what error we get this time. So it connects. Um, oh, read buffer failed. That's not great. Hmm. Read buffer failed. I mean, I guess we did change read buffer, but not by all that much. Um, wait, so this means that uh, request is failing. Read more bytes, have four. So how many bytes does it have when it tries to do this decoding? Uh, have bytes. Wait, it works some of the time? That's terrible. Um, have 41 bytes. So sometimes it works and sometimes it does not. Um, and also the path it gets back is empty, which is a little disturbing. Hmm. That's odd. So the times when it... Read buffer failed. Forty-one bytes. Okay, let's uh, try to inspect what these bytes actually are. In each case, so here's a case where it fails. Then we get those bytes. Byte. Uh, okay, and a case where it succeeds. We get these these bytes. So that's kind of interesting. So they're the same number of bytes. But for whatever reason, one we can parse and the others we cannot. Huh. The XID we got back, we parsed just fine regardless. So let's look at our uh, response parser. The, the response from a create session should be, you first read the protocol version which is four bytes then you read the timeout which is four bytes uh, then you read the session ID which is eight bytes one two three four five six seven eight I don't think that's true I find it very hard to believe that the session ID is the same every time, but okay. And then it reads the password. Pa 
password, you say? Which is encoding a length. I don't believe that that's true. I think we're missing something. And then the read only. Because this uh, read buffer, so read buffer reads four bytes and tries to read that many things. There's just, there's just way too many bytes. So this can't be right. I feel like that password is like this zero or something. Um, so when we parse this, ah, uh, this is a different kind of response though. So the thing we get from the server is first the length, which at this point we've already parsed out, right? Yes. And then the XID, which is the next four. So what is this then? This reads from four. So this means you should not read the XID when it's a connect response. Oh, that's weird. Right, you see this? So it reads the length, which is zero four, and then XID, which is four, four. But then it reads offset four, which is four, for the connect reply which to me implies that the XID is not there. So I guess we, if we know that this is the first response. Yeah, the part that's changing is probably the session key, I agree. But the, this just means that the, the XID we shouldn't be reading for the connect reply, which is a little bit disturbing because it, um, it means that you basically have to know first. It means, to, it means we need to know whether we're decoding the first response or a subsequent response. Um, so basically this is going to be if self.first then so we're gonna let xid is then it's zero then we know it's the connect response otherwise it's we're gonna read the xid um and then self dot first is false yeah i mean that's uh it's not really connected as much as it's first but yeah All right, that seems all good. So that's better. Um, and then for, okay, and then we're at create. So create reads the, uh, let's see, response to create should just be the path. Oh, and the opcode. No. Oh, right, right, right. I've completely forgotten about these other fields. That's right. So um, it also, Zookeeper also keeps track of a bunch of these timestamps that you need to pass around to ensure that you um, keep progressing. And we're not currently parsing those out. Um, so we do need to parse those out. Where does this parse those actually? That's a good question. Uh, response. Um, 
Yeah, so that's something that's just extracted over here somewhere by the thread that's spun up by... Um, ah, where is this? Yeah, so these additional IDs are not generally something the user needs to know about. Um, here. Yeah, it's a reply header. This thing. Um, and the reply header, they parse here. Right. And that reply header holds ZXID, what else? Where does reply header come from? Proto, probably. XID, ZXID, and error. Right. Yeah, technically this should probably be a connection state as opposed to just first. Um, but so let's see. Uh, ZXID is this actually is a, an I sixty four and error. So reply header is an I32, an I64, and an I32. What does it do with the error? Yeah, so there's also writes. So you can get a response to a close. That makes sense. This is where they handle connection responses. Uh, we don't currently implement timers and timeouts either, which is something we'll have to do. Um, just like this whole thing. But crucially, we do need to read out these fields. And then this would be XID. Um, we're gonna need things like the Z, the ZXID and the error. We're gonna need later, but for now, uh, we just need to make sure that we parse them out. Otherwise, they'll be a part of the response. Um, let's see. Empty. Empty is a uh, very few bytes. Why is it empty? Um, I mean, this sort of suggests that this, no, this can't be right. Length is 16, which is 8 plus 4 plus 4. So where's the content of the... Where's the create response? Hmm. It's a very good question. Let's uh, fire up Wireshark, shall we? And on loopback, I want port 2181. And then let's run this again. Okay. 2181. All right. No, don't. Uh, see what it's be. Right. So now I want to follow the TCP stream. So we sent, so this is us sending the uh, connection request. This is the connection response. This is us trying to create slash foo, and this is the response we get back. All right, so this packet So 
this first four is the length uh, and that length is 16. You see the, the one zero is 16. Uh, and that, that's correct because the length is 20. Um, and then we get uh, four bytes of ZXID, which is one, which is correct because that's the XID we assigned to the first request. And then we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So 53 is the ZXID. And then this is the error code, FF. Oh, so maybe there was an error that occurred then. How do we know what the error codes are? Hopefully that's also listed somewhere. Um, hmm. Oh no. Error. It's not gonna be easy to find, is it? Actually, let's look at the Rust one instead and see if there's a, any error parsing going on here. Source. Um, error. So keep a drive. It seems like something else. Const. Aha. That's what we want to see. So this, I want this whole thing. So we're gonna have uh, error dot error dot rs. It's gonna have this whole file and we're going to do here prepper i32 uh, and also derive debug and this is going to be a this as zk error so proto mod we're also going to have a mod error I guess we'll do this and then if error not equal to zero then you print lin this error so now it's the question how do I create one of these I think I can just do this what do I have to do from error Enum. Do any of you remember off the top of your head? Um, Don't really want to match. You can use transmute. That's not really. Uh... Ah, num macros. I don't really want to depend on that, but. This 
this also give me, I guess, num derive? Derive numeric traits. I mean, I guess that's what I want. I'm a little sad I have to add, add a crate for it, but num derive is 0 0.2. And then I want z uh, source lib turn crate and then derive and now we want this to also derive from primitive um oh i need macro use as well i guess um find derive macro from primitive in source. Uh, that seems really unfortunate. Oh, did I do that stupidly? Can't find crate for num traits. Seems weird. Um, I don't really want to do this this way. Um, so in that case, let's just do this pub fn from uh, actually impul from i32 for this, from to the self code. So, and then we want to substitute with, no, I only want from here. Oh, did I do a stupid? I did, didn't I? This is going to be this. Ah, oh, regular expressions. is not legal. Uh, the substitute preview, I think, is new in, um, in NeoVim. I don't remember exactly what the replace. So, uh, it's a good question. It's somewhere in here. I think it's relatively new, but it's really nice. Uh, I don't remember. You'd have to look through. It's somewhere in my VimRC, um, which is on GitHub. If you look at uh, at my repositories, there's one called configs, and that has all of this. Um, so yeah, if you take a look that, there, you should find it. All right, what error did we get? It's saying marshalling error. 
Oh, so the request we sent to Zookeeper was wrong. Interesting. Well, then it's not terribly surprising that it didn't want to do that. I guess actually the what this gives you back is it resolves either with an error or a ZK error. Uh, and then here, ah, uh, that's awkward. This or ZK. probably tidy up that a little bit later but um, 28 is going to be a result of this and zk error this will hold a sender of result this this looks like a place for a type alias but a little bit because now here where we send the response um, we sort of want let mute error is none uh, error code code then error is sum this and then uh, if let sum e is error then uh, tx dot send e dot is okay else we do this Gonna happen regardless. Um, and now 239, this is gonna send an okay. So basically this is just wrapping the one shot so that we're, we can send errors back as well. Um, we might want to just unify these and not have two separate errors, but for now, let's do it this way. Um, we're gonna match on R. And if it's an OK, this, uh, then we do this. Uh, if it's an error E, then we panic with E. And if it's anything else, then it's unreachable. Uh, I think plain vim has this feature now as well, actually. Uh, but you'd have to check. Great. So now it actually errors the way we're expecting it to. Marshalling error. So why is it that the string we send is wrong? I'm, like, fairly sure that it's... Uh, Uh, request. So for some reason, it doesn't like this. I mean, I'm like almost certain it's the ACL. Um, or maybe it's the flags. What do flags have to be? So for zookeeper here if you do create you have to select the mode ah yes yeah, so we probably do have to give some kind of mode here and that's what we're missing um, so specifically create request when it makes this create request 
What does it make it with? Mode as I32. Yeah, and modes are probably not allowed to be zero. No, persistent is zero. So I should be allowed to do that. Um, ah, if the ACL is invalid or empty, invalid ACL is returned. So we have to send an ACL. I don't want to. Uh, that makes me really sad. I wanted something that was straightforward to implement. Uh, ah, let's do exists instead. Yeah, let's do resist instead. Um, so I don't think crate will actually be that hard, except we'll have to also port the the ACL stuff, um, which I don't want to do at the moment because we're already running like very late. So an exist request has a path and a watch. And I'm guessing watch is like a U8 or something. It's like a bool. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, what exactly is a... Uh, how do I find one? Proto. Give me proto. So an exists request is a string and bool request. Okay, so it, it really just is a UI. And the response is a stat response. The stat response is a stat. And what is a stat? Oh no. Data stat. Oh no, it has so many things. All right, fine. We'll uh, get a stat. So I guess we'll do something like source data or source. Uh, I sort of want to call it types, but it's not really types. Yeah, fine. Let's do types RS for now, and then we'll deal with that later. Um, so stat is in types. Uh, this is going to have a mod types. It's going to pub use stat. Uh, what is our, what does exists return here? An option stat. Okay, great. Um, so we change this to be exists. It takes a path. It returns an option stat. It's gonna not make a create, but an exists with a path and a watch, which is gonna be zero and exists a stat it's going to get back a stat all right so what was the response to this exist response is a stat response which seems to always be sum so when would this ever return Oh, ZK error no node. I see. So error ZK error no node is none. So that's how it does it. Bail. Uh, this is called failed. Oh, right. We have it actually finishes up. So this is going to be exists, which takes a path and a uh, watch, which is just going to do buffer write uh, u8 uh, watch exists, exists. Uh, let's 
see. And now our test, of course, is going to call exists that like so. Uh, and I guess response. This is now going to have exists, which is going to be a stat. So we're going to use stat there. Uh, we're going to get a stat back. And we're going to need a way to deserialize a stat, I guess. So what's the stat read from? So where is read from implemented for stat? There we go. Is we probably want to borrow more of these traits. So this is one of, as I mentioned before, like um, if someone else has written the protocol before, especially in the same language, it just saves you so much work. Uh, like these are these aren't necessarily all that hard to write. Like if you look at them, it's not like there's something that we uh, would have a really hard time writing once we have the struct. It just really convenient not to have to. Because um, now in here, exists gives us an exists where stat is stat read from uh, reader. Spawns 32. Oh. And I messed up my syntax here somewhere. Yep. Um. What else do we have? ZK error. Uh, use types. No, use uh, proto error. ZK error. There's uh, pretty clearly a bunch of cleanup we could do for the organization of this library. Um, I'm just, I want to get to the point where the um, where all the base functionality works. Actually, let's do, uh, oh, that's already there. So I just want protos in there. So now 59, this doesn't work because expected result found option. Expected result. Found option. Oh, and then okay, some stat. Okay, none. Seven. All right, let's see. Does foo exist? Uh, still a marshalling error? Code request exists. That's so weird. 
Is there a zookeeper log? Uh, failed to process. Establish session. Failed to process. Get data. Unreasonable length. Oh, I know we're doing wrong. When we're sending the request. Oh, where is this? Um, let's see. So, give me. This is the port is twenty one eighty one. What is it we're sending out? When we send out our request, this one, we send a length. Wait, the first four bytes should be the length. Why does it think that the length is uh, very long? That's very long. Whereas clearly the length is set correctly for the connect. So I think this is the length for the string. So in the request we send out, we first give four bytes of length, then four bytes of XID, then four bytes of opcode, then a length, and then the string. 2f. That seems far too long. Oh, wait, 4. 1, 2, 3, f one, two three 4. And then 1, two three four and then one two three four yeah something's not right here because we're supposed to send uh the length no i shouldn't need to send zxid um the request header is just length followed by xid followed by uh opcode and all of those are four bytes uh, yeah, the request header is just XID and opcode, and opcode uh, is uh, is just an I32, and the length is an I32. Am I miscounting here? Because like if if this is indeed where the where the data starts. Then four bytes for the length, one, two, three, four bytes for XID, one, two, three, four bytes for the um, opcode. What is opcode for exists? Opcode for exists is three. There's no three here. So this makes it seem like we don't actually send the opcode. Or like we send the first three bytes of the opcode and then it gets overwritten or something. Oh, I wonder whether that's what it is. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's totally right here. We're not actually sending the uh, uh, the opcode. This needs to send opcode uh, exists. Uh, yeah, so I couldn't do it. Great. So now we get back exact exists some whatever. And that's actually because I did it earlier. If I do, 
Uh, ZK Cly. Give me a command line interface. Help. Uh, delete slash foo. And now if I run it, I get exists none, right? Exists none. And if I create foo, banana, and then I run it, now I get some with a data length of six, which is how long banana is. Yay! Okay, so we now have uh, we now have connect, and we have just any arbitrary one of the calls. Specifically, we have exists. I think that's pretty good. So this is basically how far I wanted to get today, um, to get to the point where we have a fully running asynchronous uh, client. It just, it's obviously nowhere near feature complete, but as you've been following along, hopefully you've seen that we've sort of built all the internal infrastructure we wanted for the asynchronous stuff. And you even saw just how simple it was to change from create to exists. It was very straightforward. And of course the hope would be that adding the other methods should be as well. Um, there is still some more complication in terms of adding things like watchers. So um, if you look in the original API, there's also this notion of you can give it a watcher um, and uh, no, that's not it. There's like a way where you can, yeah, listener, I think is the one. Uh, so you can basically set it to watch or listen for a changes in a given path and you'll be notified whenever that path changes. And of course, the way we could implement this is uh, you could uh, call watch on some path and it would give you back a stream over stats of that path. For example, right? So that would be a way in which um, the user, we, we could actually give a nicer API than what you can currently get from the current crate because we can integrate all of these very nicely. Um, I think we're gonna probably call it right around there. Is it pub sub? Um, yeah, so I think with the watcher API, you can basically use Zookeeper as pub sub, except that it's not quite pub sub, it's um, whether a given path has changed so the contents of a path or its flags, um, you don't. It's not like you get an infinite queue that you can ke just keep pushing things to. It's you can watch a given path, or I think you can watch anything under a given path, but I'm not sure. Uh, we'd have to dig into that more. Um, although hopefully, so one of the, the so one of the reasons why I want to stop here is we've been running pretty long and we've sort of. Um, uh, gotten to cover most of what I wanted to cover today. The other reason I want to stop there is because the stuff that we've covered so far has basically been independent of Zookeeper. It's mostly been about like, how do you implement a protocol? Uh, how do you implement it async? How do you use Tokyo on top of that? Uh, and sort of how do you package this and test this at least in a somewhat trivial way? Um, but the core that we have for Tokyo Zoo Zookeeper now is actually pretty solid. Like the the, the way it's implemented internally, its internal state machine, um, is now extensible to the point where we could add another, um, another method or two, and they were pretty straightforward to add to the existing setup. Um, and so that means that the, the next stream in the series will probably be adding a bunch of the different methods and see how they tie into the infrastructure we've now built, um, and also add things like listeners and watchers and other things that are more Suekeeper oriented, uh, as opposed to just sort of like, almost general uh, protocol level infrastructure. In fact, one thing that would be really cool is if there was a way to take essentially the packetizer that we have and write it up in a more generic way so that you could have any protocol use this as its internal state machine. Um, but I think that's a, that's a task for a much later and different time. Uh, all right, I, th I think that's where we're gonna call it for today. Um, if you have questions about, so I'll, I'll push all the changes and, and, uh, and maybe tidy up some of the debug out, but, but I'll push all of that. And if you have questions about the stream for today, if you have questions about uh, Zookeeper or the implementation we're doing or upcoming streams, then just like ping me on Twitter or on Patreon um, and I'll take a look and try to get back to you. My plan going forward is that the next stream will be on this as well. It looks like it, it might be feasible for us to get pretty far with this library over the course of a, 
uh, one more stream. Um, but I think it will be at most two more streams of this. Um, I also want to do some more things on uh, standard library implement implementations, like try to implement our own mutex maybe. Um, but there are a lot of cool projects we could tackle. So if you have ideas for that as well, then let me know. Uh, I hope you've found it interesting and, and, and uh, educational and like feel like you were debugging with me as opposed to just uh, watching me turn my hair out. Um, but yeah, I think that's all for today. Uh, thanks for coming out to watch. And uh, I'll see you next time, I hope. All right. Bye.